Chapter 111, The Tragic Experimental Subject To Roy, the only existence that might threaten him in this world was the sea goddess Calypso. Although Roy did not know how, she had actually been sealed by a group of mortals, making Roy a little confused as to whether Calypso was a real god. But at least she possessed extraordinary power. This was beyond doubt. Not only could she create an indestructible ship like the Flying Dutchman, but she could also revive the dead, guide the souls of the dead, and create enormous storms on the sea. These were all abilities that Roy could only look up to for now. Although she was still in a sealed state, her soul was trapped in a mortal body, and she was unable to use her divine power, no one could guarantee that the pirate lords would not be stupid enough to release her. After all, demons came from other worlds. When they crossed worlds from the abyss, they had already violated the rules of the native world and posed a huge threat to it. If Calypso was really a god of this world, then protecting the rules and eliminating threats was one of her responsibilities. Once she truly became free, she was very likely to attack Roy. Roy was only a middle rank demon now, and he had no confidence in confronting deities. Therefore, in order to prevent such a situation from happening, Roy felt that it was necessary to eliminate the risk in the cradle. Since Jack Sparrow had come knocking on his door, Roy took the opportunity to obtain the seal token on Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow had not participated in the sealing ceremony back then, and his token was passed down from his father, so he did not understand the importance of the token. This gave Roy a chance. Now that he had this token, Roy did not have to worry about anything. Roy also wanted to test out the effects of the demon gold by letting Jack Sparrow take it away. He could already tell that the black gas on the gold was a dark power similar to a curse, but Roy did not know whether it would turn people into undead creatures like the Aztec gold coins in this world. He needed to observe it. After putting away Jack Sparrow's seal token, Roy opened the system interface and began drawing. This time, Roy drew something that looked like an eyeball. In Roy's imagination, this eyeball would be a camera that could be used for reconnaissance and would directly transmit the captured scenes into Roy's eyes. It was equivalent to a clone of his eyes. In order to make the eyeball fly like a drone, Roy added a pair of small bat wings. Demon eye, controllable, flies, teleport positioning, voice communication, invisibility, high definition camera, image transmission. Roy had long wanted to create something like this, so he took this opportunity to create it. Roy had not used his teleport skill that much, and his teleport destination had always been tied to Fat Tiger. Now that he had this demon eye, Roy bound teleport coordinates to the demon eye, which was equivalent to expanding his teleportation range. As long as he made more demon eyes and spread them around, the vast sea would no longer be his obstacle, and he would be able to go anywhere in this world. However, this demon eye consumed a lot of souls to exchange. The other functions were nothing, but the two definitions of teleport positioning and invisibility were quite expensive. In the end, Roy spent 80 souls to materialize one demon eye, making him click his tongue. These were the souls he obtained from killing after activating the Halo of Fear. If they were ordinary souls, it would have probably needed a hundred. One eye would cost 80 souls, 10 eyes would cost 800 souls, and a hundred eyes would cost 8,000 souls. Although Roy wanted to make more, looking at the consumption, he felt that he should not make too many for now. With a flash of light in his palm, the demon eye with small wings appeared in Roy's hands. Roy gently tossed it and the demon eye flew into the sky and flapped its wings as it chased after Jack Sparrow. At the same time, the scene observed by the demon eye was transmitted into Roy's eyes. These two visions felt very strange, and Roy found it difficult to adapt for a while. This made Roy a little worried that it would be a bit difficult to process so much information when there were more demon eyes in the future. It appeared that he had to think of ways to improve it. Fortunately, after studying it for a while, Roy found that he could cut off this image at any time. Because it was flying, the demon eye quickly caught up to Jack Sparrow. In order not to let Jack Sparrow discover it, Roy controlled the demon eye to turn invisible. Then he discovered that after the demon eye turned invisible, it would slowly draw out magic power from his body to maintain its invisibility state. This was because the demon eye he created was actually a type of magic machine, not a creature, so he needed to provide it energy when it was invisible. Invisibility did not consume much magic power and with Roy's current amount of magic power, it can last for quite a long time, so it was nothing. At this moment, Jack Sparrow was rowing his boat with one hand and holding the demon gold Roy gave him with the other. From time to time, he would take a bite to verify the authenticity of the gold. Jack Sparrow looked rather happy currently. He was humming an unknown pirate song and looking very pleased. However, 
Roy discovered that the black gas on the gold was gradually contaminating Jack Sparrow. The gas was still very faint, but the longer he was in contact with gold, the more the gas would contaminate him. Jack Sparrow knew nothing about this, and he was still happily playing with gold. Roy was not surprised. He had demon eye land on the mast of Jack Sparrow's boat and continued to observe Jack Sparrow. About an hour later, Jack Sparrow's boat suddenly shook. Under the sea, a huge sailfish crashed into the bottom of Jack Sparrow's boat for some unknown reason. The shaking just now was caused by it. The sailfish escaped, but during the collision, its hard, sword-like bill had created a hole in the bottom of Jack Sparrow's boat, and seawater kept flowing in from the hole. After checking the damage to the hull, Jack Sparrow cursed. However, he did not have any materials to repair it, so he could only quickly pull up the sail and let the boat move forward with the wind. He found a bucket and desperately scooped out the seawater pouring into the bottom of the boat. But everyone knew that this could only delay the sinking of the boat. In the end, it would be useless because just Jack Sparrow scooping out water alone would never catch up to the speed at which the water was pouring in. Damn it! Hang in there! Jack Sparrow cursed as he scooped water with all his might. It's still far from land. I really don't want to tie sea turtles to my feet. However, reality did not change based on one's will. No matter how hard Jack Sparrow tried, the water at the bottom of the boat was still accumulating. In the end, Jack Sparrow had no choice but to put his gold into a bag frantically, carry the bag on his back, and then jump into the sea while holding a wine barrel. As the boat sank, Jack Sparrow could only hug the wooden barrel and rely on its buoyancy to float in the sea. Thankfully, as an excellent pirate, he was still able to identify the direction in the sea. But before long, Jack Sparrow's face turned green. He felt as though something had stung his foot, and a sharp pain soon came from his foot. A beautiful jellyfish with its umbrella-shaped bell slowly floated past Jack Sparrow. Damn! Why is there a jellyfish here? Jack Sparrow's eyes popped out when he saw the jellyfish. Thankfully, he recognized this jellyfish's species and knew that the jellyfish's poison would not be fatal. He hurriedly sprawled on the wooden barrel and lifted his feet out of the water to prepare for emergency treatment. When he lifted his feet, Jack Sparrow saw that his ankle was swollen. But he did not have a knife at hand, so he could only use his nails to cut his skin open and squeeze out the blood inside. However, even though he squeezed out the poisoned blood, greater trouble appeared. A triangular fin appeared in the sea in the distance, and it was rapidly approaching Jack Sparrow. A shark was attracted by the smell of blood. This did not mean that the smell of blood would certainly attract sharks. It depended on whether there were sharks in the area. But Jack Sparrow was just unlucky. This shark happened to pass by when he was squeezing out the poisoned blood. Seeing the shark, Jack Sparrow panicked. Normally, as long as people did not move, the shark might not attack anyone. But the problem was that there was still blood on Jack Sparrow's foot. With no other choice, Jack Sparrow could only take a deep breath, sink into the water, and prepare to fight the incoming shark. Fortunately, what he encountered this time was not a great white shark but a slightly smaller hammerhead shark. This kind of shark would only hurt people in extreme situations. Jack Sparrow understood its habits and eventually drove it away. Jack Sparrow resurfaced and lay on the wooden barrel, panting heavily. Even so, he did not abandon the gold on his back. He thought that there should not be anything more. But to his surprise, after floating on the sea for more than an hour, there was a strong gust of wind. Although it was not a storm, the wind was blowing in a different direction than where Jack Sparrow was heading. Under the strong wind, Jack Sparrow was getting farther and farther away from his original course. This time, even Jack Sparrow was at his wit's end. There were no ships in sight, and he could not even ask for help. He could only let the wind take him away in despair. After seeing Jack Sparrow's misfortunes through the demon eye, even Roy was shocked. He finally understood what the curse on demon gold was. It seemed that after being contaminated by the black gas, Jack Sparrow's luck kept declining, so much so that he encountered unlucky events one after another. It was just that he did not know if this demon gold, which could bring about bad luck, could cause the holder to become unlucky enough to die. Sometimes, bad luck was very cruel. If you were extremely unlucky, you could even choke to death just by drinking water. Roy shook his tail and thought, if the owner is really unlucky enough to die, what would happen to their soul? Chapter 112 Invincible Armada The gold produced in the abyss actually carried a curse power that could cause misfortune. This was something Roy did not expect. Captain Jack Sparrow's bad luck was still continuing. Unless he could spend the gold and transfer it to others, 
Roy felt that this continuous bad luck would kill him sooner or later. And what Roy was thinking about now was the souls of people who held the demon gold after being killed by bad luck. If he could effortlessly obtain a large number of souls through this demon gold, would that not be very satisfying? However, the real situation was that the gold mine Roy found in the abyss must have been discovered by other demons before, but they had not paid much attention to it. As a result, the gold mine had been there for a long time without any signs of excavation. Therefore, Roy could only guess that this demon gold might be useless to demons. The demons also had to know that the curse power attached to the gold could curse greedy people to death. But something like gold was circulated after all, and not everyone who obtained the gold would die of bad luck. They would spend the gold most of the time. This way, they would no longer be exposed to the gold anymore, and the curse of misfortune would gradually dissipate. This led to the curse of misfortune being uncertain. Apart from this uncertainty, Roy guessed that there might be another possibility. Even if someone really died of bad luck, these souls of those who died of bad luck would not directly appear in the hands of the demons but instead need the demons to retrieve them. This was a very troublesome matter, and it was probably the real reason why demons did not care about the gold. After all, Roy did not sense any force or anything connecting him to the gold after giving it to Jack Sparrow. If this truly were the case, it would be such a pity for the gold. It was clearly a very good thing. Roy touched his demon horns and could not help but start thinking if he could do something to change the situation of demon. Gold. Perhaps he could leave a special mark on the demon gold, and this mark could make the soul of someone who died from the curse of misfortune return to his hands automatically after being exposed? Gold was something that could be preserved for a long time. If he could engrave this special mark on the gold, Roy would spread a portion of the demon gold with the mark every time he went to a world, allowing it to circulate in this world for decades and centuries. Then the gold would turn into long-term meal tickets and continuously transfer souls to Roy. This thought made Roy's heart race. Even if only one out of ten people who had come into contact with the demon gold died from bad luck, it would still become a huge number after accumulating for a while. The curse of the demon gold was also determined based on the greed of the human heart. If someone was too greedy and held a large amount of gold, the curse of misfortune would be stronger, and it would only make them die faster. It would be Roy's loss if he did not take the souls of such greedy people for almost nothing. However, it was quite difficult to create such a mark. Because Roy could not stay in a world for long, and he would have to return to the abyss sooner or later, the souls would quickly dissipate without special preservation. This led to Roy needing to have the ability to teleport souls across worlds in order to retrieve them in the abyss. To achieve this function, it would probably consume a lot of souls. Moreover, the mark also needed to be preserved with the gold for a long time. To ensure this, the mark might require powerful magic power. And if he had to engrave such a mark on every gold bar, even Roy might not be able to take it. Therefore, after engraving this mark, it was best to have it last forever once and for all. This was another huge consumption. In short, just thinking about it made Roy feel that such a mark was not easy to make. Currently, Roy had more than 3,400 souls all of which he had obtained after constantly attacking pirates. Especially when he fought against pirate Lord Damon's fleet, Roy had unleashed his halo of fear and obtained many high-grade souls. So these 3,400 plus souls could be used as nearly 4,000. Roy reckoned that this amount of souls might be enough, but Roy felt his heart ache at the thought of spending so many at once. However, this was equivalent to taking out a large sum of money to invest. In the later stages of the investment, you would be able to recoup the money through dividends. As long as there was enough time, the original investment would be able to be returned. Roy estimated that Frostmourne had cost more than 1,400 souls to make. If Frostmourne could be regarded as orange equipment, then something made with 4,000 souls should be at the dark gold level, right? And if he could use tens of thousands of souls to create an item, then it should be at the level of a divine artifact. Just as Roy was thinking about how he should design and define the attributes of this mark, Cassandra suddenly warned Roy. Master, there are a lot of ships on the sea. Upon hearing this, Roy could only interrupt his observation of Jack Sparrow. After ordering the demon eye to continue following, he stood up and looked in the direction that Cassandra was pointing. Sure enough, Cassandra was right. On the sea far away, he could vaguely see a large number of sails and masts. There were more than 30 ships, and all of them seemed to be large ships. These ships were sailing at a steady, moderate pace. Roy could not tell what ships they were, but they did not look like pirate ships but instead like warships? Since they were not pirate ships, Roy could not be bothered. He returned to his chair and sat down, 
leaving Cassandra to continue observing the warships. However, not long later, Cassandra shouted to Roy, Master, those warships seem to have discovered us. They've changed course and are heading toward us. Huh? What are they up to? Roy was puzzled, so he picked up the small spyglass left behind by Jack Sparrow and looked at the warships. He thought that these warships might be from the Royal Navy, but unexpectedly, after seeing the flags on the ships, Roy realized that these warships were actually Spanish warships. It's not the Royal Navy but the Invincible Armada? Roy was confused. He did not know much about the historical background of the pirates of the Caribbean world. After all, it was a magically revised world that could not be viewed as real history. But this was the Caribbean Sea, and the ones active here should be the Royal Navy. Why did he not see the Royal Navy and instead met the Spanish first? Just as Roy was feeling puzzled, Cassandra suddenly said, "A hey master. What's wrong? Roy asked. I I remember now. Cassandra said. When I was in the village, I saw the same flag as these ships have. Oh? So you're Spanish? Roy reacted. Roy could understand various languages by using the language of souls, so while he could understand what other people were saying, he might not necessarily be able to tell what language they were using. As a lich, Cassandra used the language of the undead, and she was just a little girl from the countryside. She did not know much and could not tell where her hometown was, so it was only now that Roy knew that she was Spanish. This was really. If Cassandra had discovered this a little later, Roy might have already prepared to kill his way to the church in England to avenge her. They seem to be getting ready to attack us? Looking at the Spanish warships across from him through the spyglass, Roy saw a large number of soldiers busy moving on the decks. Roy was even more confused when he saw the dense cannons on the sides of the ships. I don't seem to have offended the Spanish, have I? Why were they preparing to attack the moment they came without saying anything? Do they know what they're facing? Chapter 113 Exorcism Prayer At this time, in this sea, it was the English Royal Navy and the Spanish Invincible Armada that were fighting for supremacy. In the mid-16th century, Spain established the largest fleet at the time in order to protect its maritime transportation routes and its overseas interests. The fleet dominated the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean and proudly called itself the Invincible Armada. The Spanish relied on the Invincible Armada to plunder large amounts of gold and silver, quickly making Spain the richest maritime empire in Europe. At that time, English was also in the budding state of industrial development. A large number of manufactured industrial products forced it to look for oversea commercial markets, and innovations in ship manufacturing and navigation technology further boosted England's ambitions to capture colonies. For Spain, it naturally would not allow other countries to infringe on its interests from the colonies. Thus, in this historical background, England and Spain were like fire and water. At the time, England's maritime forces were not strong enough to compete with the Spanish naval fleets. However, England adopted a method of conniving the pirates, issuing them privateering permits and using the power of pirates to interfere with and attack the Spanish. The pirates organized their attacks at sea and robbed Spanish ships that carried gold and silver, causing Spain to suffer massive losses. The Queen of England allowed the pirates to offer their wealth to clean their identities. She even gave the pirates the corresponding nobility according to the amount of wealth they offered, leading to the wealth and gold that they had plundered from the sea gradually flowing into England. England used this wealth to gradually make the Royal Navy stronger and began to compete with the Invincible Armada for maritime supremacy. At this point in the Pirates of the Caribbean world, the Invincible Armada had actually declined after a few unsuccessful expeditions against England. But regardless, it was still a powerful force at sea. The Invincible Armada was incomparable to the Black Sea Fleet led by Pirate Lord Damond. What appeared in front of Roy was only a portion of the Invincible Armada. There were more than 30 ships, all of which were sailing warships. The entire fleet carried about 20,000 soldiers and sailors, as well as nearly a thousand cannons. It was a huge fleet that the Royal Navy could only deal with carefully. More than 30 sailing warships lined up on the surface of the sea, facing Roy with their sides. The densely packed cannons aimed at the frozen ghost ship, and after the order, hundreds of cannons fired at the same time. A few seconds later, deafening booms resounded as the entire fleet dealt a due to the powerful recoil from the firing. Hundreds of cannonballs flew toward Roy's ship. Although most of them fell into the sea and became near misses, the remaining ones hit Roy's ship. Dozens of cannonballs bombarded the frozen ghost ship at the same time, blowing it into countless fragments. Before the Spaniards fired, Roy had already flown up with Fat Tiger and Cassandra. Although the cannonballs had not hit him, 
Roy felt furious when he saw the frozen ghost ship being destroyed again. The second one. Why do the frozen ghost ships get destroyed so soon? Roy's face darkened as he waved his hand. Free attack. Roy had never thought of provoking the Royal Navy or the Invincible Armada, but since the opponent had already come, Roy naturally could not back down. Roy flapped his demon wings and charged toward the Invincible Armada. Fat Tiger and Cassandra followed closely behind. In fact, Roy now roughly understood why the Invincible Armada had appeared here and attacked him. The reason was probably the same as Ammon's. In this most important period of science and ignorance, it was the most sensitive moment for the religious world because the development of science was constantly shaking the foundations of theocracy, especially in countries like Spain that were established with Catholicism. When it expanded its colonies, Spain had consolidated its rule by preaching the doctrines of Catholicism and telling people that they ruled for God. If something unexplainable by Catholicism appeared at this time, it would certainly affect its image and status and shake its rule. This was why the Spanish later destroyed the Fountain of Youth, because the Fountain of Youth did not appear in the doctrines at all, and they could not explain it. Especially now, when Spain was declining in the struggle for hegemony, it urgently needed the doctrines to maintain the stability of its rule. What happened to Cassandra was also related to the current situation in Spain. In order to consolidate its rule, the gradually declining trend of witch hunts was once again flourishing. The church needed to declare its power through such activities, and Cassandra and her mother were among the victims. Now, Roy had determined that one of Cassandra's other revenge targets was actually the Church of Spain. Logically speaking, Roy was a demon, and it was actually a good thing for the church to have a demon appear in this world. This was because it could finally prove that the demons in the Bible really existed and that angels similarly existed. This sounded a little ironic because it was a demon that actually proved that the doctrines were correct. Therefore, the Spanish were actually both happy and pained about Roy's existence. On the one hand, they were happy about the correctness of the doctrines, on the other hand, they were pained that they had to find a way to eliminate this demon. In fact, if possible, the people of the church wanted to let the entire world know of Roy's existence, but there was nothing they could do about it. Since they claimed that they were the agents of God in the world, they could only set an example and eliminate Roy, God's enemy. The news about Roy, this demon, had yet to spread it to Rome. If it reached Rome, a new round of the Crusades might begin. Roy had underestimated the great influence he brought with his appearance in this world. Of course, this also had to do with him taking revenge for Cassandra. In fact, other demons had come to this world in the past, but they had not done what Roy did. They had all merely appeared briefly before returning to the Abyss, so they only left behind some vague rumors in this world. Learning from what had happened to Pirate Lord Damond, the Spaniards had come prepared. When Roy landed on a warship, what awaited him was not Spanish soldiers holding cutlasses or guns but priests holding crosses and Bibles. Although the ten or so priests on the ship looked quite old and had beards, they were still quite agile. The moment Roy landed on the deck, they immediately rushed forward and surrounded Roy from afar. They each held a Bible tightly in one hand and raised a cross in the other while chanting loudly at Roy. Bless Michael, Archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. When they faced Troy, this demon, their eyes had no fear, only fanaticism, because these priests were the most devout priests selected from Spain. As they were chanting loudly at Roy, Roy felt a familiar force acting to him. It was the repulsive force of the world. The exorcism prayer that these priests were chanting actually triggered the power of the world and increased the repulsive force on Roy. Damn it! Is this a secret method? Roy could feel weak magic power from these priests. Roy thought that they might be able to use some holy light spells to attack him, but he did not expect that their magic power would trigger the world's repulsive force. In fact, almost all exorcists used exorcism spells based on the principle of triggering the world's repulsive force. These exorcism spells were taught to humans by angels, allowing them to use them to expel demons. A huge sense of heaviness assaulted him, and Roy felt that even his movements became difficult. If he had not signed a demon contract with Cassandra, Roy suspected that he would have been expelled back to the abyss by this sudden increase in repulsive force. Not only Roy, but also Fat Tiger and Cassandra, who landed on the other warships, were being attacked by the exorcism spell of the priests. However, what was surprising was that Fat Tiger and Cassandra were not as affected as Roy. 
Fat Tiger was created by Roy, and he could not even be considered an abyss creature, so the repulsive force of the world had very little effect on him. Cassandra was a person of this world, and it was only because of Roy's demon blood that she had transformed into a lich, so the exorcism prayer had no effect on her at all. While the priests were restraining Roy, a group of soldiers holding spears carefully approached him. The spears in their hands were specially made weapons permeated with holy water. Before they approached, Roy could feel a force that disgusted him from the spears. Looks like you guys really spent a lot of effort. Roy sneered and waved his hand. Frostmourne appeared in his hand. The tip of the sword pierced into the deck, and the next moment, a strong ice storm erupted with Roy's body as the center. Be it the priests chanting the exorcism prayer or the soldiers holding spears, they did not even have time to react before they were swept into the storm. This huge tornado appeared out of nowhere on the warship, twisting and twisting as it flew toward the sky. The people swept up were immediately frozen and rose with the wind. The ice tornado ravaged the entire warship. It almost took all of the people on the deck away, and even the ship froze. After the tornado disappeared, countless ice blocks with people inside fell down from the sky like meteorites, crashing into the sea, splashing high waves. Chapter 114 Ice Age Seeing Roy destroy a warship in the blink of an eye, the captain of the two warships beside it became anxious. Damn! Why is the exorcism prayer useless? No, it's useful. At the beginning, that demon's body was indeed sluggish. Right, but this demon is too powerful. Our priests don't have enough strength to expel him forcibly. It seems that this time, the Lord is truly testing us. Prepare the archers and ballistas. In this era where muskets and cannons were the means of long-range attacks, there were very few archers on ships. However, in order to complete the feat of demon slaying, the Spanish not only deployed archers on every ship but also set up big killing weapons on the ships, ballistas used for whaling. Perhaps some people might ask why they would use cold weapons like bows and ballistas instead of guns. This was because, be it bows or ballistas, their arrows could be soaked with holy water and even be cast with silver. These were all things in the records that could cause harm to evil creatures. If it were muskets, they would probably not even be able to fire after soaking in holy water. The two warships moved closer to the ship Roy was on, and then a large number of arrows rained down on Roy on the deck. The attack power of these arrows was originally nothing to Roy. With his body's current defense, even modern firearms might not be able to injure him, much less bows and arrows. However, the appearance of the priests earlier raised Roy's vigilance. So instead of resisting the arrows head-on, he flew into the sky. These arrows nailed onto the deck and failed to hit Roy at all. But the moment Roy flew up, the ballistas at the bows of the two warships fired. These ballistas could adjust angles, so they could actually hit targets in mid-air. Faced with the rapidly approaching bolts, Roy turned and dodged. With his agility in the air, how could he be so easy to hit? However, Roy clearly realized how well prepared these Spaniards were. They had come prepared. They were regular troops, and they were not at all something that the pirates could compare with. In this situation, Roy could no longer land on their ships to attack them, and he even had to pull higher into the air so that he would not be shot by arrows. Not long after Roy flew high, Fat Tiger took Cassandra and also flew up. Fat Tiger burned her ship, but Cassandra had been hit by many arrows with holy water, and she seemed to be in bad shape. The bones on her body showed signs of burning and eroding, and smoke was constantly rising. She looked very dispirited. Holy water might do limited damage to demons, but it was much more harmful to undead creatures. Cassandra was on Fat Tiger's back and did not even have the strength to speak. Stay in the sky. Roy instructed Fat Tiger. Then he waved his hand, and Frostmourne slashed at a warship below, striking with icebound strike. The crescent-shaped black ice blade whistled down and slashed at a mast of this warship. After easily cutting it off, the ice blade landed on the deck and exploded freezing most of the deck. The Spanish soldiers affected turned into pieces of shattered ice, and not even blood could splash out. Roy stayed in midair and continuously slashed icebound strikes downward. However, it was only useful at the beginning. When the Spaniards recovered from their panic, they mobilized some soldiers that went to the decks with shields. Then they used these shields to block Roy's ice blades. This was indeed useful. The shields in their hands were equivalent to detonating the ice blades ahead of time. Although the soldiers holding the shields were inevitably frozen into ice sculptures, after they defended against the ice blades, their people could still stand on the decks. TSK. Roy curled his lips when he saw this and stopped the useless attacks. After discovering that Roy had stopped, 
The Spaniards immediately thought that Roy was out of moves. They loudly shouted the name of the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit, and their morel sword. To them, this was a sacred war of demon slaying, a war to promote the glory of the Lord. No matter what enemies they faced, they firmly believed that they would win. However, the high morale Spaniards did not know that their actions had angered Roy. First Ammond, now the Spanish. When is it going to end? Of course, Roy knew very well that with the reckless personalities of demons, they had never considered public opinion in the past at all. Even if some religions that worship demons occasionally appeared, demons were cruel and even killed their own people, let alone these believers. As a result, they were no match for the angel faction at all. In the end, almost every world would have these fanatical church members coming out to exterminate demons. However, these people simply did not understand that ordinary people like them could no longer defeat middle-ranked demons like Roy. If they wanted to kill Roy, they had to at least be able to communicate with heaven and have heaven send an angel to descend. Otherwise, they had to have magic power like Davy Jones, and it might be possible to expel Roy. Furthermore, it was merely a possibility. It was hard to say how high the chances were. Roy was a frost demon. Unlike other demons who used fire, his strength was not restrained in the sea, and he could even display a greater effect than a land. It could only be said that the Spanish had made a foolish mistake to fight Roy at sea. Roy was a little angry now. He had thought that destroying Ammon's fleet would make the people of this world understand some fear, but he was still attacked by another fleet. This time, it was the Spanish, but what about the next time? The Royal Navy? Although he would be able to harvest quite a lot of souls, it was still very annoying. It just so happened that Roy had told Jack Sparrow he would make the people of this world feel fear for Demon Osiris. Since he had already said so, he might as well make an example of the Invincible Armada. Moreover, after settling the Invincible Armada, Roy was also planning to visit the Royal Navy. If he fought against the pirates, the Invincible Armada, and the Royal Navy, the three largest forces at sea, he believed that there would be a lot fewer people who would overestimate themselves. Roy opened the system interface and exchanged all 3,400 souls into a super bottle of Magic Essence Growth Potion. Roy had originally planned to use these souls to make the marks, but he could not care so much now. Anyway, as long as he could deal with the Spanish this time, he would be able to harvest more souls than these 3,400. After downing the potion, Roy's magic power surged once again. As the ranks increased, the amount of magic power converted by demons devouring souls would gradually decrease. If a low rank demon swallowing a soul could gain one point of magic power, then a lower middle rank demon swallowing a soul could only gain 0.8, and a top middle rank one could only gain 0.7. This was also the reason why higher rank demons required more souls. Similarly, the higher the rank of a demon, the harder it was to promote. After all, magic power could not increase indefinitely. Fortunately, Roy used the system to make potions, extracting more magic power than directly swallowing the same souls. This was also the main reason why he improved faster than other demons. Now, the potion of 3,400 souls had made Roy gain more than 1,900 points of magic power. His total magic power directly exceeded 3,000, meaning that he had officially entered the level of top middle rank demon. It had to be said that this feeling of monopolizing souls in a world was very satisfying, especially when it was certain that no opponent could threaten the life of the demon. It was no wonder that the illusion demon Caesar had schemed to stay in a world forever. This magic power value of over 3000 made Roy feel the surging and formidable magic power in his body. He could not imagine what the magic power torrents were like in the stronger demon lords. Roy landed. But this time, he did not land on a Spanish ship but instead on. The sea. He landed not far away from the nearest warship, but it was neither within the range of the enemy's cannons nor bows and ballistas. The position was very safe. The Spanish also noticed this. The captains on all the ships immediately shouted and ordered the soldiers to move their ships closer to attack Roy. However, Roy ignored them. He stood on the surface of the sea, where he had frozen into a floating piece of ice. Roy squatted down on this floating piece of ice, put away Frostmourne, and placed his hands into the sea, submerging the back of his hands. The Spanish sail warships were aggressively closing in on Roy, and all the soldiers on the ships were ready to fight with Roy. But just as their ships were about to enter the firing range, Roy made his move. Ice Age. Roy's surging magic power gushed out, passing through his hands into the sea. Then it rapidly turned into a powerful frost power that spread throughout the sea and instantly expanded to an enormous area. With a click, 
as if Roy had pressed a camera's shutter, everything froze. Within the dozens of square nautical miles, the originally undulating waves were frozen and turned into layers of ice. The Spanish warships on the sea were frozen as well. Entire hulls, sails, and even all the soldiers on them turned into lifelike black ice sculptures. Even the expressions on their faces were frozen. The wind was not calm, but the waves were still. The noisy sea suddenly became dead silent. On the blue sea, only an exhibition of black ice sculptures remained, and this exhibition consisted of more than 30 sailing warships and nearly 20,000 Spaniards. Roy took his hands out of the ice and flew into the sky. He looked at the sea frozen by ice age and shook his head. The range is still not large enough. Compared to Aokiji's frost power, it looks like I'm still a little lacking. Chapter 115 Cassandra's Revenge Perhaps in the impression of many people, ice and snow only had one color, white, pure, and flawless. However, this ice island Roy created that occupied a large area of the sea resembled a black crystal, carrying a mysterious and strange magnificence. Everything froze in an instant, creating a timeless beauty. It was the most unique art of Roy's dark cold magic power. Walking on the black crystal-like floating island, Roy admired his masterpiece. Although Roy had learned this Ice Age move from Admiral Aokiji, he had not used high-quality souls to create this skill because this skill was too simple. It was nothing more than brainlessly and crazily outputting the power of ice, requiring no special manipulation. However, compared to Aokiji who could directly freeze a straight, Roy's freezing range was not considered large. Moreover, he discovered that despite it being brainless magic power output, he was still lacking skill in magic power output. In the seawater below this floating island, some parts had icicles growing out that pierced toward the bottom of the sea due to the concentration of magic power. While some places had a weaker distribution of magic power, so there were no such icicles. If he were to dive into the water, he would see a scene that looked like dog teeth interlocking at the bottom of the floating island. Oh, quite a few fish were frozen as well. If Roy could control the output of his magic power better, he might be able to make an evenly flat ice surface at the bottom of the floating island or he could merge these icicles into a single icicle that connected to the seabed. This way, the floating island could even take root here and not drift with the waves. After realizing this, Roy found the next direction of his training. He needed to master the technique of skillfully controlling magic power output. He might be able to do this quickly or slowly, and perhaps it was one of the skills that had to be mastered to become a high-ranked demon. While Roy was looking at the ice sculptures, Fat Tiger and Cassandra landed and followed closely behind him. After seeing the lifelike expressions of the soldiers through the black ice, Cassandra could not help asking, Master, are these people still alive? Still alive, but they're going to die soon. Roy replied without looking back. Roy deliberately did not use the dark power contained in the ice to make the ice sculptures collapse. He planned to keep them for a long time, so the frozen soldiers were actually still alive. However, this would only be for a short period of time. In many movies and novels, living creatures that had been frozen tens of thousands of years ago could still recover after defrosting. But this kind of thing was basically deceiving people. Even the so-called cold hibernation technology used for interstellar travel required the corresponding drugs to protect the human body. Otherwise, the cells of living creatures subjected to extreme cold would quickly die. In particular, when low temperatures were transmitted to the inside of the human body, the water in the body would also turn into ice causing the volume to increase, thereby constantly squeezing the internal organs and bones. In the end, the immense pressure would crush the organs and bones. Just like the high temperatures of flames, the low temperatures of frost were also fatal. Take advantage of the fact that these guys aren't dead yet to absorb their life force. Roy said to Cassandra. There are nearly 20,000 people. Such a huge amount of life force is enough for you to advance once. With enough strength, you'll have the power to protect yourself after I leave. Cassandra nodded without saying anything and began to absorb the life force of these Spanish soldiers. She absorbed life force, and Roy took away the exposed souls afterward. As the large number of souls entered the system, Roy could not help but think about how he was going to use them. The Spanish Invincible Armada was not the same as Pirate Lord Damon's fleet. Large ships carried more people, and Davy Jones would not care about the lives of these Spaniards. This time, he had not come out to disrupt Roy so nearly 20,000 souls fell into his pocket. This was a number of souls that would make even high-ranked devils envious. But frankly, even though he obtained so many souls, there were many places to them. First of all, he had to consider the problem of leaving a mark on the demon gold. 
Although this kind of mark could not bring a huge number of souls to royal like during battles, it was better in that it was like thin streams that would flow forever. There was a lot of demon gold in the abyss, and Roy could dig out hundreds of tons and spread them to every world he visited. As long as people viewed the gold as valuable and circulated it in these worlds, there would definitely be people who would come into contact with this gold of misfortune and bring an unending stream of souls to Roy. In addition to the creation of the mark, there was also a demand for the growth of Roy's magic power. His magic power value had already reached the top middle rank, but he did not know how much magic power was needed to advance to high rank demon. For demons, the increasing demand for magic power accompanied them throughout their lives, and it was impossible to stop. This also required a lot of souls. Finally, it was Roy's defensive needs. During this battle with the Spanish, Roy was attacked by the exorcism prayer. Although he relied on his magic power to resist the expulsion, it made him understand the changes that would happen to his situation in the future. With the increase in his strength, Roy would come into contact with more high magic worlds. At that time, more powerful enemies such as archmages, high-level spellcasters, paladins, powerful warriors, and people with superpowers would gradually appear. To demons, the greatest threats were likely holy power and the power of a world. The power of a world was still okay, as it would only forcefully expel demons without causing any harm. However, holy power was different. It was a power that could kill demons. And those who could use holy power were usually angels and high-level exorcists. Angels and demons had always been arch enemies, so the main opponents of demons were angels. But because there were fewer angels, they were selective when it came to chasing down and killing demons. When a low rank demon appeared in a world, angels would not care at all. When a middle rank demon appeared, it might attract some attention, and when a high rank demon appeared, there would definitely be angels coming out to fight. If a demon lord or even a demon king were to appear, then even high level angels would have to step forth. At this time, it often meant a massive war between light and darkness. In short, in order to deal with the threat of holy power, Roy needed to strengthen his defense and resistance, and he could start making the demon armor he had considered before. And this time, Roy had a better idea. After possessing the dark cold magic power, he could make his demon armor a skill. This way, once he used the skill, he could equip the armor by using dark ice crystals as armor materials to create a black ice armor. At the same time, he could use a large number of souls to define powerful attributes for this black ice armor. Now that Roy had 20,000 souls in his hands, as long as he was willing, he could even make a divine artifact level armor. When the time came, Roy's dark ice would have strong physical defense and fire resistance. If he could define a holy light immunity attribute, he would not panic even when facing a high level angel. He just did not know how many souls he needed for an immunity attribute. Such a term probably involved the level of nomological laws, right? While Roy was deep in thought, Cassandra's voice suddenly came from up ahead. She said in surprise, Master, come quickly. What happened? Roy walked over and found Cassandra standing in front of an ice sculpture, staring at it with her hollow eyes. This is. Roy looked at the ice sculpture and found that the black ice was sealing a middle-aged Mediterranean man. This man looked kind. But Roy could see the viciousness and insidiousness hidden deep in his eyes. He was wearing a robe, and the style looked slightly like those priests but different. It seemed like he was from... The Inquisition? It's him. Master. I'll never forget this face. Cassandra pointed at the man with a tone full of hatred. Mom burned at the stake after he condemned her as a witch. So, the church enemy you're looking for is him? Roy asked with a flash of understanding yes. Yes. Cassandra said sadly. Although there were many other people that helped commit the evil deed of arresting mom, I can't remember what those people looked like. Only him. This is really. Roy did not expect that Cassandra would find her enemy on one of these Spanish ships. It seemed that the Church of Spain had mobilized most of their forces in order to deal with Roy. Now that Roy made a clean sweep, the church probably suffered heavy losses. So, what do you want to do now? Roy asked. Cassandra thought for a moment and said humbly to Roy, Master, I beg you to bestow this person's soul to me. Oh? You've advanced? Roy finally noticed that the magic power emanating from Cassandra seemed to have risen to a new level. Yes, Master. After absorbing so much life force, I seem to have become a real lich. Cassandra said. I have a feeling that I can control the soul. In that case, give it a try. Roy said. Cassandra nodded and absorbed all the life force of the man in the ice sculpture. Then Roy reached out, grabbed his exposed soul and handed it to Cassandra. 
Cassandra truly seemed to have some talent in the undead arts. Her skeleton's hands grasped the soul firmly and held it in her hands. How do you plan on dealing with this soul? Roy asked. I'm going to put him in a rotting corpse and make him the ugliest and most lowly ghoul. Cassandra said hatefully. Hearing this, even Roy was stunned speechless. Hatred is indeed a terrifying force. Chapter 116 Just Wait About an hour later, Roy completed the soul harvesting and finally left with 19,762 souls. Although he had left, the huge floating iceberg island formed by more than 30 sailing warships of the Spanish Invincible Armada remained. Even though the floating island would gradually thaw due to the sunlight and the temperature of the seawater, the process would last for a long time, at least for half a month. Thus, just like that, this black floating iceberg island, which covered an area of dozens of nautical miles, slowly drifted on the sea along with the current. Before long, a merchant ship discovered the black floating iceberg island. As the ice was slowly melting, the power of darkness inside also dispersed, causing the iceberg island to be covered in a thin layer of black mist. Black represented inauspiciousness and mysteriousness, so the merchant ship did not dare to approach the floating island. The sailors on the ship could only observe the island carefully through spyglasses. When they realized that this floating island was actually made up of warships, the sailors were stunned. They recognized these ships from the Invincible Armada and saw the Spanish soldiers that were frozen into ice sculptures. Together with the news that the Invincible Armada had appeared on the Caribbean Sea some time ago, they immediately realized what happened. Even the Spanish Invincible Armada was annihilated by the demon. Although it was only a part of the Invincible Armada, people did not care that much. After the merchant ship reached shore, the news spread like the wind throughout the Caribbean. Currently, only normal trading merchant ships were safe on this sea where the demon roamed. Many people risked their lives to get on merchant ships to take a look at this floating island. There were also some pirates among them. But the owners of the merchant ships firmly rejected the pirates because they were afraid the demon would retaliate against them for carrying pirates. In fact, many merchants were now very worried that pirates would pretend to be merchant ships to head out to sea, which would cause normal merchant ships to be attacked by the demon on the Caribbean Sea routes in the future. Therefore, the merchants united to put pressure on the pirates so that they could find the murderers as soon as possible and hand them over to the demon. As more and more people witnessed the black floating island and learned of the true reason for the destruction of the invincible armada from various channels, people became more and more fearful. This floating iceberg island was just like an ancient tomb that showcased the achievements of demon Osiris to the world. The impact on people's hearts was unimaginable. Even the Church of Spain, which had mobilized so many priests and members of the Inquisition, could not suppress this demon. How powerful was this demon? Thus, people prayed hoping that the Lord would send an archangel to eliminate this demon. They kept telling others about the horrors of demon Osiris, and they believed that demon Osiris was a disaster. It was precisely because of the savage and evil pirates that caused this disaster. Some even believed that demon Osiris was heavenly punishment from the Lord. The Lord believed that the pirates could no longer be redeemed, so he allowed the demons to reap their souls. In short, Roy's demon name had reached a stage where he could stop children from crying in the Caribbean. Although it sounded a little old-fashioned, it was the truth. The name of Demon Osiris was one of the ways that many mothers used to threaten brats. It went like this, you still dare to cause trouble? If you continue to cause trouble, Demon Osiris will come and take your soul away. Whenever Jack Sparrow heard this, he sighed. Yes, Captain Jack Sparrow did not die. Although he was misfortunate and unlucky all along the way, he still managed to survive and reach land. He also realized his constant bad luck during this period of time might have something to do with the gold he obtained from Demon Osiris. So to prevent himself from dying of bad luck, Jack Sparrow quickly spent the gold the moment he came ashore. He did not use gold to buy a ship. For pirates, when they had a large sum of money, the first thing they needed to do was to indulge in debauchery. Jack Sparrow was no exception because he was also a pirate. To him, if he wanted a ship, he could get one by scamming others. But with money, he had to buy rum. As one of the limited number of people in this world who had interacted with Roy, Jack Sparrow naturally understood that this demon named Osiris had really done what he said. Now, all the people in the entire Caribbean would tremble in fear at the mention of the name Osiris. They were completely dominated by the fear brought by this name, especially the pirates. The most vicious insults and curses toward their opponents were may Osiris take away your damned soul. Jack Sparrow had been staying in Tortuga Port during this time, and he did not dare to go out to sea again. He felt that if he went out to sea, he might run into the demon again. 
Jack Sparrow had thought it through. The last time he could come back alive was probably because the demon wanted him to bring the gold back to shore. That demon wanted to let this gold with the curse of misfortune spread in the human world. Every time he thought of this, Jackson shuddered in fear. He had to admit that when he thought about how he had almost cut off one of his arms to get more gold, his back was drenched in cold sweat. Jack Sparrow was really frightened. After being a pirate for so many years, Jack Sparrow was considered an experienced and knowledgeable person. But he felt that the dangers he encountered in the past were simply nothing compared to this demon. Not only was this demon powerful, but he also knew how to make use of people's greed. Jack Sparrow also knew that many pirates had seen his unrestrained spending in Tortuga Port. He merely wanted to spend this gold of misfortune as soon as possible, but no one else knew. He was certain that once these pirates who coveted his wealth used force to snatch his gold, he, who was alone and had no subordinates, would be able to resist a few pirates, but he would definitely not be able to resist more than a hundred pirates. If he wanted to live, he had to hand over all the gold he had. Then, some pirates who were not satisfied would think that he had found a treasure and would try to find out the origin of the gold from him. This kind of plot was all too common among pirates. With just a bit of imagination, Jack Sparrow was able to think of the subsequent plot, so he felt that he should not pretend to be great and try to hide this information. Even if he did not say it, there would be other lucky or unlucky people who would exchange for gold from that demon. At that time, there would also be greedy people who would restrain their fears, and they would look for that demon to exchange for gold, just like moths flying into a flame. Since that was the case, he might as well be straightforward and share this information with others. So, when he happened to get drunk in a tavern, Jack Sparrow told the story about his encounter with Demon Osiris. When they found out about this, the people in the tavern were first stunned, then they were shocked. This news quickly spread, leaving countless people tossing and turning all night long unable to sleep. On the one hand, they were afraid of demon Osiris, on the other, they were greedy for gold and wealth. They wanted to go out to sea to search for the frozen ghost ship in exchange for gold with demon Osiris, but they were also afraid that demon Osiris would kill them and seize their souls. So much so that they constantly hesitated and struggled. Before they could even see demon Osiris, they were already suffering from strong mental torture. A poor painter drew the image of demon Osiris on paper. In this painting, the background was a black ice island. On the ice island were countless twisted human ice sculptures, and in the sky were black hexagonal snowflakes. A ferocious-looking demon was floating in the air, his wings covering the sky. In his left hand was a hideous skull, and in his right was an apple. The skull symbolized the fear he brought to the people of this world, and the apple represented the temptation. Obviously, this painter had never seen demon Osiris before, but his painting was widely believed to be the true image of demon Osiris. Even later, in the holy scriptures of the various religions of this world, when they recorded the incident of demon Osiris, this painting was included and passed down in the world. Roy did not know about these following events. After leaving the floating iceberg island, Roy brought Cassandra and Fat Tiger to find an uninhabited island in the Caribbean Sea to stay. He did not make another frozen ghost ship. This time, he planned to build a fixed base and wait for people to hand over Cassandra's enemies, the pirate murderers. Roy knew that people would definitely do so after experiencing the tragic defeat of Pirate Lord Ammond and the destruction of the Spanish Invincible Armada. Roy did not know who the murderers were, but pirates had connections with other pirates. The pirates would find out which the pirate crew did it sooner or later. With the fear Roy brought rooted in the hearts of the pirates, he did not need to seek them. In order to calm Roy's anger, the pirates would voluntarily offer the murderers. Now, he just needed to wait. Chapter 117 Teodalma Although the uninhabited island that Roy chose was not large, there was a rather tall mountain on it. From the looks of it, this island was not a coral island born from the sea but formed by the drifting and shifting of tectonic plates. When Roy saw this mountain, an idea struck him, and he used his magic power to freeze the entire mountain. Then, at the foot of this mountain, he created a huge throne made of ice. Sitting satisfied on the throne, Roy stabbed Frostmourne into the ground. From today onward, this place will be called the Frozen Throne. Hmm. The Black Frozen Throne. This could be considered a bit of wicked fun. It was mainly because after Roy discovered that his demon blood could actually create a lich, he felt that he might really be able to find a world where Arthas existed one day. This Frozen Throne established in the Pirates of the Caribbean world could be considered as a preview in advance. He would leave the Frozen Throne behind and hand this island over to Cassandra when he left. 
The people from the church and the Inquisition who burned her mother to death were already dead, and the pirates who killed her would also be caught before long. Cassandra's revenge would soon be completed, and Roy had to return to the Abyss eventually. However, Cassandra could not leave with him and could only stay in this world for the time being, so Roy felt that it was necessary to find her a place to rest. Cassandra's magic power attribute was the exact same as Roy's. When Roy left, her magic power would still be able to maintain this frozen throne. Now, Cassandra had grown into a qualified lich after absorbing large amounts of life force, and she already had the strength to protect herself. Because her phylactery, which was her soul, was in Roy's hands, Roy had already made a box that could preserve her soul for a long time. This way, even if she were really killed, she would revive after some time. Although there might be a period of weakness, as long as Roy did not destroy her soul, she would not die in this world. As time passed, as long as Cassandra could absorb enough life force, she would become stronger, and perhaps she could really grow into a Lich King here. Of course, the premise here was that the more powerful existences, such as the sea goddess Calypso, would not do anything to Cassandra. Roy did not know if this existence that was regarded as a god could really eliminate a LICH. In any case, Roy still wanted to protect Cassandra as much as possible. After all, she was the first lich that Roy could summon. Yes, she could be summoned. It might not work in the Abyss since the Abyss rejected almost all non-demon creatures. Perhaps Cassandra would not be able to enter the Abyss, but maybe in other worlds, Roy could summon her through the connection between Cassandra's phylactery and her body. Roy had such a thought when he took the seal from Jack Sparrow. The only person he knew that could pose a threat to Cassandra was Calypso, so he planned to let her stay sealed forever. However, Roy felt that if he were Calypso, he would absolutely not sit back and watch a demon bring the seal back to the abyss, so Roy speculated that there was a chance that Calypso would come looking for him. Therefore, Roy was prepared to negotiate with Calypso. It was not impossible for him to return the seal token to her, but if they could not reach an agreement, Roy would follow his original plan. At this time, Cassandra found a corpse. It was a corpse that had long rotted away on the uninhabited island. Perhaps it was a victim who had been pushed ashore by the sea. After obtaining this rotting corpse, like what she had said to Roy earlier, Cassandra stuffed the soul of the person who had burned her mother into it. What was laughable was that Roy and Cassandra still did not know this guy's name. Although it was described with the verb stuff, it was actually a type of undead magic to revive ghouls cast by Cassandra. Liches were high-level undead creatures and were born with the ability to manipulate corpses. Cassandra could resurrect this rotten corpse, but what she obtained this way was nothing more than a skeleton soldier or a zombie. The corpse itself would not have any consciousness because it had been dead for too long, but Cassandra used the corpse as a vessel to imprison and preserve the soul of her enemy. This way, what she resurrected would be a ghoul, and this corpse would become the cage for the soul. After obtaining the body, the memories of the original owner of the soul would be restored, letting him remember who he was. However, he was a fervent believer whose soul could not go to heaven as he had imagined but was instead imprisoned in an ugly and rotten corpse. He had no choice but to live as a ghoul, and while enslaved by Cassandra, he was also constantly tortured by the desire to seek flesh and blood. Roy felt that this guy would definitely go crazy. This was the cruelest means of revenge that Cassandra could think of, and Roy did not find it strange. With Cassandra's intense hatred and resentment at that time, it was impossible to satisfy her vengeance by simply killing her enemy. Only this way of revenge could fulfill the demon contract she signed with Roy. About a week later, a pirate ship with a white flag approached the uninhabited island. The pirates really caught the murderers and sent them to Roy. This group of murderers who killed Cassandra were not real pirates but a slave trading ship that went between Africa, America, and Europe. To them, piracy was only a side occupation. This was also why Roy and Cassandra had not been able to find these people in the Caribbean Sea after such a long time. After killing Cassandra, these people had already gone to do business, and it would take several months to travel back and forth on the ocean during this era. In fact, this group of slave traders who had killed Cassandra did not even remember who they had killed before. They had done so many things before, so how could they possibly remember? However, when they were doing repairs elsewhere, they received news of the appearance about the demon, but they did not know much about the exact situation. Only when they went to the Caribbean for repairs did they receive the most accurate news. When they learned that demon Osiris was looking for a pirate with a missing ear among the murderers, they realized that the demon was looking for them. When they became aware of this, this group of slave traders broke out in cold sweat. The only thing that was worth celebrating was that when they docked, 
they happened to leave the fellow with the missing ear on the ship to guard it, so the pirates had not recognized them for the time being. In a moment of desperation, they hurriedly rushed back to the ship and actually killed their companion with the missing ear. They initially thought that they would not be discovered, but unfortunately, their thoughts were too simple. As a slave trading ship, they were the main suspects. Now, the pirates and civilians at every port of the Caribbean Sea were panicking. In order to quell the demon's anger, they were trying to find out the whereabouts of these people. As outsiders, they had already been targeted the moment they reached shore. When people discovered that they were destroying a corpse, they immediately realized that something was wrong with this group of people. Before they could even set sail, a large number of pirates had already surrounded them. The pirates had all sorts of tricks up their sleeves. After they interrogated these people to find out about their situation and salvaged the corpse with the missing ear, the pirates finally heaved a sigh of relief. They could report to the demon. However, after this period of time, the pirates were currently most afraid of demon Osiris, so no one was willing to send this group of people to Roy. They pushed each other, but no one was willing to accept this task. The best candidate was originally Jack Sparrow, who had interacted with Roy before, but the problem was that Jack Sparrow was unwilling to go. He was unwilling to meet Roy again. Just as they were arguing endlessly, a person appeared. She expressed that she was willing to lead the pirates and also said that she could ensure the safety of the pirates who were escorting the captives. And this person was the witch Teodelma, the mortal body of the sealed sea goddess Calypso. Therefore, when Roy saw Teodelma walking down from the ship, he realized that everything was truly coming together. Chapter 118 Descendant of the Titans The pirates who came together to escort the slaves also disembarked from the ship behind Teodalma. They were trembling in fear, but when they looked at the deserted beach, they could not help but ask in disbelief, Is Demon Osiris really on this island? Of course he's here. My divination won't go wrong. Teodalma pointed to the distant mountain and, Look, isn't that black ice and snow? Even without me, you would have found this place in the future. Which, it's not that we don't believe you. A bearded pirate said. But are you really sure that we can get through this in one piece? Why don't we leave these guys on the beach and leave now? Diodalma looked at the pirate and smiled, revealing her black teeth. Of course, you can leave, but. Are you really willing to give up on the gold? Upon hearing this, the pirates hesitated. That's right. Although many pirates felt that the demon might not necessarily hurt this group escorting the murderers to him, who dared to guarantee such a thing. No one dared to take this risk, and the timid were all terrified. The reason why these pirates dared to participate in the escort task was not only because they were braver, but also because they were stimulated by the demon gold. Jack Sparrow's experience had already spread among the pirates. They believed that perhaps since they participated in the escort and offered the murderers to the demon, the demon might give them a chance to play the demon's game like Jack Sparrow. In fact, they were not confident in the assurance of the witch Diadalma. Not many people knew her true identity at this moment, but their greed still surpassed their fear and prompted them to follow. Humans died for wealth, and birds died for food. This was the mentality of these people. Therefore, when they heard Diadalma mention the word gold, they endured their fear of the demon and tried their best to wait on the beach. The caught slave traders were already crying their hearts out. They wailed and begged the pirates to let them go. But what they received in return from the nervous pirates who burst with anger was being whipped and they became covered in blood. What was funny was that the leather whips in the pirates' hands were all found on the slave trading ship. These slave traders often used these whips to whip the pitiful slaves. Perhaps they never dreamed that one day these whips would be whipping them. Listening to the miserable screams of the slave traders, Diodalma was expressionless. She knew very well that humans were the cruelest to their own kind. They invented bows and blades in order to hunt other animals, but they invented bullets and firearms in order to kill their own kind. From this point of view, humans were very similar to demons. He's here. Diodalma suddenly said while the pirates were whipping the slave traders. The pirates quickly restrained themselves. They took out the gags that they had prepared beforehand and stuffed them into the mouths of the slave traders who were still screaming. They were afraid that their cries would make demon Osiris unhappy. They raised their heads and looked at the distant mountain peak. Then they found a giant bird-like shadow flying in the sky and coming toward them. There was a commotion among the pirates, and they began to retreat. As Roy flew closer, they saw Roy's appearance clearly. Although many of the pirates present had heard about Demon Osiris, this was the first time they saw Roy. When they saw Roy's slightly curved demon horns and the huge demon wings on his back, their fear reached its peak. If Roy activated the halo of fear, 
All the pirates here would become crazy from fear. After all, there was a limit to human fear. Once the threshold was exceeded, nerves would break down. The only thing the pirates were glad about was that demon Osiris did not attack them when he appeared. Roy floated in midair with his arms crossed, looking at the pirates below and the leader, Diadalma. After a while, he landed in front of her. He was more than two meters tall and had strong muscles, making him look tall and burly. Diadalma and the pirates could only look up at him despite Roy standing on the ground. This domineering look made the pirates fear Roy even more. Miss Calypso, I didn't expect you to come personally. It's an honor. Roy grinned at Teodalma, revealing his sharp teeth. To be honest, this smile was really friendly. But in the eyes of the pirates, it was different. The demon smile scared everyone. It seems that you already know who I am. Teodalma rubbed her fingers and said expressionlessly, but call me Teodalma. Demon Osiris, is this your true name? If I say yes, will you believe me? Roy asked. I don't know. Diadalma looked directly into Roy's eyes. During my long years, I've seen a few demons from the abyss. Some of them were cunning, but there were also some who were trustworthy. I wonder which one you are? Hmm. Roy thought for a while. Perhaps the latter. Is that so? Diadalma laughed. I think it should be the former. Otherwise, why would you deceive Jack Sparrow to get that very important thing? No, no, no. How can you say that I deceived him? Roy shook his finger. Jack Sparrow left it willingly. All right, whatever you say. Anyway, I never had much hope for these pirates. Upon saying this, Diodalma's face sank. But since I've already appeared here, shouldn't you return that thing to me? However, Roy avoided this question for the time being and instead asked, Miss Diodalma, can I ask a question? What question? If you can remove the seal. What will you do to the pirates who sealed you? Roy asked. Humph. Teodalma snorted coldly, but then gritted her teeth and said, I will bury them in the darkest depths of the sea. Although Davy Jones was the mastermind behind Calypso being sealed, it would be a lie if she said that she did not hate his accomplices, the nine pirate lords. It was a great humiliation for a god to be sealed by mortals. Hearing this, Roy grinned again. Then, esteemed lady, let's make a deal? I'll help you take back all the seal tokens and lift your seal, how about that? However, Teodalma did not even think about it and immediately refused. No. I will never let you do that. Why? Don't you want to return to your divine body? Roy asked. But I won't place this hope on a demon from another world. Teodalma said firmly. Let alone all the seal tokens, even the one you're holding now, I have to get back. Roy was silent for a while. What if I say? No? In that case, Demon Osiris. Diodalma said solemnly, I won't care which Demon King's subordinate you are, I will kill you. Don't doubt that I can do this. I am a descendant of the Titans. In the ancient inheritance of the Titans, there is a way to kill demons, and even your soul won't be able to return to the abyss. Oh? You can do this even though you're sealed in a mortal body? Roy asked with interest. Do you want to take a gamble? Diodalma stared at Roy, unwilling to be outdone. After a while, Roy suddenly grinned and waved his hand. It was just a joke. I don't want to fight against a god now. That won't do me any good. After hearing these words that ease the atmosphere, Diodalma's imposing manner weakened a little. But at this moment, Roy suddenly said, Speaking of which, are you trying to lure me into killing this mortal body of yours? Does killing your mortal body cause you to break free from the seal? Ridiculous. Diodalma refuted expressionlessly. He could not tell what she was thinking. But under Roy's observation, Teodalma's entire body had tensed up just now, which was a very nervous reaction. Sure enough. Roy had long found it strange. Why did the pirate lord still allow her mortal body to live after sealing the sea goddess Calypso into a mortal body? Logically speaking, the pirates should have already killed this mortal body. Would it not be better to complete the feat of killing the god once and for all? Now that Roy saw Teodalma's reaction. He realized that killing her might result in two disastrous consequences. The first was that the Calypso in her body would break free from the seal and appear. The second was that Calypso would really die and cause the entire ocean to lose control. After all, she was a sea goddess. Gods were not so easy to kill, so Roy reckoned that the former was more likely. In that case, Roy could not do anything to Teodalma. If he really released Calypso's true body, Roy would be in trouble. A descendant of the Titans. Indeed, in some worlds, the Titans were called gods. Perhaps they did not have the authority of gods, 
but just their power alone was rather formidable. Alright. To be honest, the seal token isn't very useful to me. Roy said. I can give it back to you, but it depends on what you can give me. Didn't I already bring the people you are looking for? Tia Dalma pointed at the slave traders. Roy glanced sideways at the slave traders, whose mouths were stuffed with rags and socks, and they immediately shivered. When Roy was talking to Tia Dalma, everyone was quite far away due to fear, so they did not hear what the two of them said clearly. However, when Roy looked over, the slave traders immediately knew that their lives were about to come to an end. Roy retracted his gaze and shook his head. These people were brought here by the pirates, not you. Don't say you did it. Show me your sincerity. Tia Dalma stared at Roy for a long time before finally giving in. She took out a scroll from under her robe. This scroll was rolled up and tied with a string. The moment she took the scroll out, Roy immediately sensed a rich abyss or on it. Tia Dalma threw the scroll to Roy. Roy took it, immediately untied the string, and opened the scroll. This scroll seemed extremely old. But what was strange was that the text inside was still brand new. On the scroll, the words in the demon language were imprinted as though they had been burned onto it. Among the content written on it, there was a rather large title at the beginning. Roy immediately tried to read it. Duh. Demon Bible. Chapter 6? Chapter 119 Don't mess with women, especially goddesses. Where did this thing come from? Roy looked up and asked Tia Dalma. However, to his surprise, Tia Dalma was even more surprised than him. You. You can see writing on this scroll? Roy was stunned. Can't you? No. Tia Dalma said. In my eyes, this scroll is just a blank piece of paper. If not for the strong abyss or on it, I would have thrown it away long ago. Really? Roy was deep in thought. Can only demons from the abyss see the demon writing on it? At this moment, Tia Dalma also realized that there was a mystery behind this scroll. But she did care and continued, I obtained this scroll from a demon about 400 years ago. Upon saying this, Tia Dalma glanced at Roy. That demon should be stronger than you. However, he is a flame demon. I don't know who summoned him to this world. The place he appeared was on land, so he caused great destruction and brought a huge disaster to this world. Roy did not interrupt her and listened quietly. At that time, in order to eliminate this flame demon, the church launched the Ninth Crusade. In the name of the crusade, they secretly gathered a large number of troops and attacked the flame demon's den. Tia Dalma said. Unfortunately, the church still failed. It was unable to kill the flame demon. It sacrificed a large number of soldiers but merely injured the flame demon. As a last resort, the church sought help from me. The church made an agreement with me that it would think of a way to lure the flame demon to the sea. Afterward, I drew upon the power of the sea to raise a tsunami to extinguish the flames of the flame demon. Only then did the church finally kill and expel the demon. Oh? The church sought help from you? Roy was a little surprised. Aren't you a heretical god to it? Why would the church seek help from you? Tia Dalma glanced at Roy. That's because the church couldn't invite an angel to descend. I don't know what method that flame demon used to interfere with the formation of a gate of heaven. Four hundred years ago, the church was quite powerful, and it should have had the power to communicate with heaven. But it didn't expect that a few large-scale prayers failed to open a gate of heaven, and no high-level angel was willing to descend. Without the help of an angel, the church was unable to eliminate such a powerful flame demon, so it could only seek help from me. Of course, this kind of request for help is a secret, and it was not made public by the church. Roy nodded in understanding. A gate of heaven was actually the same as a gate of the abyss. It was just a portal that could cross worlds. Generally speaking, it was necessary to have someone act as a gate-to-gate -gate guide to be able to link up a gate with a magic formation and establish a connection with heaven or the abyss. This was how Roy came to the Caribbean Sea. If he did not have Cassandra's soul and body as the guiding coordinates, he would not have been able to open the gate of the abyss no matter what. In order to forcefully open a gate of heaven or a gate of the abyss, high-level angels or high-level demons had to use their magic power. On the side of the abyss, you had to be at least at the level of a demon lord to have the power to do so. On the side of heaven, it was unknown what level of angel was required. Tia Dalma said that the flame demon who came to this world 400 years ago was stronger than Roy, so he guessed that the flame demon might be a high rank demon. However, Tia Dalma. Well, it should be said that Calypso, who was still a sea goddess back then, controlled the power of the sea, and the water attribute was very effective against flame demons, which was why the flame demon was killed and expelled. However, in Roy's impression, 
high-ranked demons usually did not invade a world alone. This was because the magic power of high-ranked demons was enough to support them summoning some demon troops to help them fight. But according to Diadalma's description, that flame demon seemed to be alone from beginning to end. Is it that while the flame demon had used some sort of method to disrupt a gate of heaven from opening, he also eliminated the possibility of him opening a gate of the abyss? Roy looked at the demon bible, chapter 6 in his hand and wondered if this was the method to create the interference. This scroll was left behind by that flame demon. Diadalma said. Due to the abyss order contained in it, if this thing were to flow out, it would be a big problem. Therefore, the church handed it over to me, and I sealed it. Now that you've appeared, I'll use this to exchange for the seal token you obtained from Jack Sparrow. Roy swayed his tail and suddenly laughed. You handed this to me because you actually want me to bring it back to the abyss, right? That's right. Diadalma did not deny it. Although I don't know what this thing is, the abyss aura in it is very corrosive. It's too dangerous. My poor little octopus pet Kraken turned into a monster just by accidentally touching it. For the past 400 years, I've had to expend a large amount of magic power on it to prevent it from continuing to pollute the ocean. Alright. I understand why you want to make a deal with a demon like me so readily. Roy was a little speechless. You just want to use this deal to throw me the burden, right? Diadalma did not answer this question and only asked, Then, do you accept this chip? Of course I accept. Roy nodded. Although he had not read the other contents of the demon bible in detail, his intuition told him that this thing was absolutely not ordinary for demons. It was enough to exchange for the seal token. However, after putting away the scroll, Roy said to Tiadalma, I'll bring this thing back to the abyss, but I'll be helping you by bringing it back, right? What exactly do you want to say? Tiadalma asked. Cassandra. Roy pointed at Cassandra who was staring intently at the slave traders behind him. I helped you once, so you have to help me too. Although she's become a lich, I want you to promise me that you won't destroy her. However, what Roy did not expect was that after hearing this request, Diadalma immediately nodded and agreed without even thinking. Sure. Oh? So straightforward? Roy was a little surprised. He frowned and said, Miss Calypso, I know you are temperamental, but I don't want you to bring this personality into this transaction. You are a god, not a demon like me, so it's not good to go back on your word. However, Diadalma snorted. Don't worry. I'm a sea goddess, and I protect the sea itself, not humans. Even if she is a lich, what does that have to do with me? After hearing this, Roy finally understood. It seemed that he was wrong. Indeed, Diadalma had said that she did not want things of the abyss to remain in this world, but Cassandra was not from the abyss. Although she was born from Roy's demon blood, she was still an undead creature. To Diadalma, the addition of an undead creature in the sea would not affect her at all. As long as this undead creature did not offend her authority of the sea. Shaking his head, Roy took out the silver coin pendant that he had obtained from Jack Sparrow and handed it to Diadalma. With the seal token in hand, Diadalma snorted coldly. Jack Sparrow. As the successor of the pirate lord of the Caribbean Sea, he actually dared to lose such an important thing. I must punish him. Oh? Roy asked with interest. Dear Miss, how do you plan on punishing him? Believe me, I'll definitely be happy to see it. Diadalma suddenly smiled charmingly and poked Roy's demon wings with her finger. What do you think of letting him be a pauper for the rest of his life? From now on, he'll have no fate with money, and all the treasures he finds will be lost. Roy clapped his hands. That's great. It's happily decided then. Although Diadaman was now sealed in a mortal body, she could still use some power. When Diadalma said that, far away in Tortuga Port, Jack Sparrow, who was dead drunk in a stable, suddenly shuddered in his sleep and woke up. But after finding nothing wrong, he mumbled and fell asleep again. Not long after he fell asleep, a stable hand, who came to feed the horses, noticed him. This stable hand carefully approached the soundly sleeping Jack Sparrow and started touching all over him. In the end, the stable hand stole the last two pound sterling banknotes that Jack Sparrow had exchanged with gold bars. Perhaps he would never have imagined that after removing the curse of the gold of misfortune, he would still not be able to escape his unlucky fate. Chapter 120 Snowflake Pattern After obtaining the seal token, Diadalma achieved her goal. However, along with her, there was the group of pirates who escorted the slave traders. They did not dare to speak to Roy so they could only place their hopes on Tia Dalma and were all looking at her eagerly. Tia Dalma did not go back on her words. 
She pointed at the pirates and said to Roy, These pirates captured the people you wanted, so I hope that you can ensure their safety. Also, I heard that you have a very special game called Osiris's Balance, right? They want to try it out. Osiris's Balance? Roy was stunned when he heard this, but he soon realized that these pirates wanted to play the same game as Jack Sparrow, the game to obtain demon gold. Roy was not surprised that Jack Sparrow had spread information about the game. But Roy did not expect these guys to give Roy's impromptu creation a name. You don't say, it's actually a pretty good depiction. Do you really want to play this game with me? Roy turned to look at the pirates. The pirates were overjoyed when they heard Roy. They hurriedly nodded. Sir Osiris, please grant us our request. Roy did not say anything and used his magic power to create two black ice chairs on the spot. He extended his hand and invited Tia Dalma to sit down. Tia Dalma did not stand on ceremony. She smiled charmingly and sat down on the chair. Then Roy sat on the other chair and faced the pirates. My name is Osiris, a demon from the abyss. However, I'm not purely a fighter, and I'm more inclined toward being a devil. On account of the fact that you sent me the murderers, I can let you leave safely, but it seems like you aren't satisfied with returning empty-handed. Since you intend to play this Osiris's balance game, it's not impossible. But I want to explain the rules in advance. Roy raised his finger. First, the things used to trade for gold can only be what you carry with you. You can't add any more. Second, because your things aren't useful to me, the gold that I exchange with you through the game also has a huge drawback, it contains a curse of misfortune. Holding this gold will cause your luck to become worse. It often leads to many unlucky things happening to you, and there is a chance that you will die. Roy directly mentioned the curse of the demon gold. In any case, even if you did not say it, the people holding the gold would discover it. The rules are these two. Decide whether you want to play this game or not. Roy said as he leaned back on his chair and looked at the pirates. The gold actually has a curse of misfortune? This was the first time the pirates heard about this, so they immediately became restless. The opinions of the pirates diverged. After hearing that there was a chance that they would become cursed and die. Many pirates immediately wanted to back out. But some of them did not care and insisted on playing this game. What's there to be afraid of? Don't we pirates pursue wealth? A pirate said loudly. In order to obtain wealth, aren't we always risking our lives? That's right. Another pirate echoed. Think about it carefully. Haven't your companions been killed in battle? Look at those who were hanged by the marines. Don't tell me the dangers of being pirates isn't comparable to a little curse of misfortune? That's right. Didn't you notice that the curse of misfortune only has a chance of death? Usually, it's just bad luck. If worst comes to worst, we can just throw away the gold before the curse kills us. That makes sense. No wonder that guy Jack Sparrow spent so much money. Looks like he wanted to get rid of his curse of misfortune. As these pirates analyze the situation, those who wanted to back out slowly change their minds. Logically speaking, those pirates who were not afraid of death should not have said these things. They were undoubtedly increasing their competitors, but they were doing this to encourage themselves so as to strengthen their determination. After discussing for a while, the pirates maintained the same tacit understanding in the end. No one planned on leaving, and they all looked at Roy. It seems like you've made your decision. Roy was not surprised at all. All pirates were like this. They were nothing more than a bunch of money-seeking villains and bandits. Any adventure or romance was actually just gold they put on their faces to improve the image their profession. Dia Dalma sat at the side and watched silently. She had interacted more with pirates than Roy, and she knew better what pirates were like. Therefore, even though she knew that these pirates would cause the gold with misfortune to spread all over the world, she had no intention of stopping it. She was a sea goddess, but her divine power could not stop the greed of humans. This demon was merely fulfilling his duty. Seeing that the pirates had made up their minds, Roy did not say anything else. He opened the system interface and created a large balance. In the middle of the balance was an image of a fierce demon. Roy designed the lever of the balance as a symmetrical pair of demon wings, and demon claws held the balance trays. Since there were no special attributes on it, it only cost less than one soul to materialize. The moment it appeared, the pirates were immediately attracted to the balance with a strong abyss style. They breathed heavily their eyes shining as they waited. With a crashing sound, Roy poured out all the demon gold he had collected from the system space. The golden light that blossomed in that instant almost blinded the pirates. When they saw the gold, they realized that what Jack Sparrow had said was true. The gold bars that Roy made were all small 100 gram bars, 
but he had dug out more than a ton from the abyss, making the number of gold bars look extremely large. The sight of these gold bars piled up messily on the ground was indescribable. If not for the fact that they knew how terrifying the demon was, the pirates might have drawn their cutlasses and flintlocks and killed the owner of the gold directly before snatching it away. Now, they could only obediently follow Roy's rules. But what Roy did not expect was that the pirates were about to fight over being first. Fortunately, not long after, the first person to test the water was finally decided. The one who came forward was a burly Germanic pirate, and he seemed to be the strongest among the pirates. After stepping forward, he looked at Roy with some fear before carefully taking off the weapon at his waist and placing it on one end of the balance. Roy was flabbergasted as he stared at this guy's weapon. He finally realized that these pirates had come prepared. This pirate's weapon was actually a chain weapon weighing more than 10 kilograms. It was also known as the flail. It would have been fine if it was just one, but this guy had more than one flail hanging on his waist. No wonder when Roy saw him walk forward, he looked a little awkward. He had already prepared heavy items for this transaction. He was not the only one. Roy glanced around casually and saw several of them with heavy weapons. Seeing that the pirate still wanted to place down the other flails, Roy had no choice but to say expressionlessly, there can only be one of the same items. He had no choice but to add this rule. What a joke. If everyone was like him, his gold would be gone in the blink of an eye. After all, there were still dozens of pirates waiting, and Roy did not want the pirates to find out that his gold had run out. After hearing Roy's words, the Germanic pirate immediately looked regretful. But it did not matter. Although he could not use the weapons anymore, he had other things. He took a shield and placed it on the balance. Then he began to take off his clothes and shoes. This guy's clothes were heavy leather armor, and his shoes were heavy boots. It could be said that the pirates had done everything they could for this game. Roy did not stop these latter things. All he needed to do was plan and spread all the gold in his hands. Before long, the Germanic pirate found that he had nothing else to put on the balance, so he picked up the gold bars and placed them on the other end of the balance. After the balance was finally balanced, the pirate finally took away 23 kilograms of gold. In order to drag away the more than 200 gold bars, he had even specially prepared a gunny sack to hold them. After the first person successfully exchanged for gold, the remaining pirates were overjoyed. Thus, they began arguing about their order. They could see that the gold on the ground seemed to be limited and that there would be less they could get later. As the pirates exchanged for gold one after another, the gold on the ground was steadily decreasing. Some of these pirates exchanged for more, while others exchanged for less. Those who were not fully prepared saw the others take away a large number of gold bars, and they were so regretful that they wanted to die. However, they did not know that it was not necessarily a good thing to take away more gold because those who took away more would probably die faster. The power of the gold's curse would stack. Perhaps when they returned, those who took away the most gold would soon be killed by envious people. This was the effect of the curse of misfortune. However, if these pirates were to compare the gold they obtained with the gold that Jack Sparrow obtained, they might discover that their gold was different. On this batch of gold bars, there was a hexagonal snowflake pattern engraved on them. Yes, this snowflake pattern was the mark Roy created. Mark of Osiris. Soul Catcher, items engraved with this mark will automatically attract and absorb the souls that appear within a radius of 500 meters. Teleport, the souls that have been absorbed will be teleported to the demon whose true name is Osiris. This teleport is a cross-world teleport. When making this mark, the Soul Catcher attribute barely cost anything but the attribute for cross-world teleportation consumed far more souls than Roy had imagined. Making this mark had cost Roy about 5,000 souls to exchange for it. Roy had designed the carrier of this mark to be a ring, and the pattern on the ring was the snowflake mark. When he wanted to engrave this mark on an item, Roy only needed to transfer his magic power to the ring and heat the ring's mark to brand the item. This way, as long as Roy mined the gold mine after returning and prepared more gold, he would be able to spread a portion of it every time he came to a world. Then, even if he did not return to that world in the future, the souls would be sent to Roy continuously. After the number of souls teleported back in the future increased, Roy also needed to create an item that could automatically store these souls. Otherwise, he might not even have the time to do anything else in the future, and he would just keep collecting souls every day. Of course, Roy did not set this mark as indestructible because he would have probably needed to pay more souls. It was not worth it. The secret of the mark on the circulating gold of misfortune might be discovered by the church one day, 
and it might confiscate the gold and refine it to destroy the marks. However, it was impossible for the church to do that in a short period of time. Such small gold bars were quite easy to circulate, and once they spread, it would not be easy to find all of them. Chapter 121 Illusions, All Illusions There were about 80 pirates, and before long, they divided up the gold of misfortune among themselves. The pirates returned to their ship happily. They were thinking in their hearts that after they returned, they would use this gold to buy a manor, returning home as rich landowners. Diadalma came with the pirates, but instead of setting off with them, she left on a small boat alone. Only Roy saw that Diadalma had taken out bones to do a divination before she left, and he did not know what result she got that prompted her to leave alone. After everyone left, Roy looked at the quivering slave traders. These slave traders were crying bitterly, looking like pitiful baby chicks, but Roy had long smelled the aroma of fallen souls in these slave traders. If pirates could only be regarded as fierce and vicious, then these slave traders were truly heinous. Their souls had already said everything. Although Roy had been controlling his soul-devouring addiction, the smell of fallen souls was really too tempting for demons. Even Roy could not help but come closer and smell their souls. But when Roy did this, the slave traders were even more terrified and collapsed. They cried and knelt on the ground, begging Roy for mercy, and some of them even peed their pants. However, Roy was unmoved. As a demon, the humans he usually came into contact with were either greedy or had dark hearts. Most of them were scumbags and villains. These people did not deserve any sympathy at all, and Roy was only interested in their souls. He turned to Cassandra and said, I'll hand them over to you. Remember to bring their souls back. Seeing Cassandra nod, Roy spread his wings and flew back to the frozen throne. Fat Tiger followed him loyally. As for what Cassandra was going to do to these slave traders, it was not his concern. It was all for Cassandra's revenge. After returning to the throne and sitting, Roy took out the scroll that Diadalma had given him and opened it. Roy stared at the scroll with a solemn expression. To be honest, he had never thought that he would obtain such an item in the Pirates of the Caribbean world. From the demon text engraved on it, it was apparent that this scroll should just be a rubbing, seemingly rubbed from an ancient stone steely. This was because Roy saw some blurry character symbols on it, which should not happen if the scroll was the original. What was even stranger was that every demon character symbol on this scroll carried a thick aura of darkness and flames. These characters were usually hidden, and only when they came into contact with demons from the abyss like Roy would they sense their aura and reappear. Demon Bible. Is this the doctrine of the demons? Roy thought in doubt. The problem is that demons only believe in power. With this doubt in his mind, Roy began to read it. Like a meteor, he pierced through the earth and continued down. Finally, he reached the depths of this world and stopped there. The kings of the seven deadly sins knelt in front of him and witnessed his great feats. The black sun and the demon moon were born. The sea had tides, and the world had levels. After giving the abyss an authority equivalent to a side of the infinite worlds, he left this place and returned to the void. The demon language conveyed meaning through the power of the soul, but the unclear text did not have the same effect so the content Roy Reed appeared intermittent. Fortunately, there was no such thing as translation errors, so Roy interpreted most of it. What surprised Roy was that this demon Bible seemed to be the same as the human Bible. It was about a creator creating a world. What differed was that the human Bible was about the process of creating the human world, and the demon Bible was about creating the abyss. Inferring from this, should there be a similar Bible that exists in heaven and describes the process of heaven being created? Roy's claws gently tapped the armrest of the throne as he read the content of the demon Bible again while in deep thought, carefully pondering over the meaning of each word. The kings of the seven deadly sins. Is this referring to the demon kings who control the seven deadly sins? If so, it means that these seven demon kings appeared in the abyss with the Creator from the beginning, rather than what the human Bible said, in that one of the angels, Lucifer, had fallen into the abyss of hell. In other words, I misunderstood. Fallen angels were a species of the abyss from the beginning? Then why can demons contaminate and transform angels into fallen angels after acquiring their souls? Is there a mistake in this? Also, the black sun and demon moon, this should be the purple moon on the surface of the abyss, right? But I haven't seen the black sun nor know what it looks like. Finally, it was the so-called equivalent to a side of the infinite worlds. Since it mentioned the infinite worlds, does that mean that there were already many different worlds when the abyss appeared? And could the so-called side be understood as meaning something like an inner world? Does the phrase equivalent to 
mean that there were many inner worlds of the infinite worlds like the abyss? Roy counted with his fingers. The abyss and heaven are definitely each considered a side of the infinite worlds. In addition, perhaps there was the underworld? Or the elemental world? This scroll was only the sixth chapter of the demon Bible, but the information involved was astounding. Since there was such a rubbing of the Bible, it meant that the original text of the Bible definitely existed somewhere in the abyss. But Roy had been in the abyss for a long time and had never heard any demon mention the creator of the abyss, and this creator did not even have a name in the Bible. Demons talked more about being the subordinates of certain demon kings, including Tia Dalma. When she saw Roy, she had said something similar. It seemed that all demons naturally regarded the demon kings of the seven deadly sins as the creators of the abyss. Of course, there was nothing wrong with this. After all, demons advocated power, and the power of first-level demon kings was something that many demons could only look up to, and the deadly sin demon kings were above demon kings. However, this was already the limit that demons could come into contact with. The creator, who had disappeared, was an illusory existence to demons and gradually became forgotten. According to Tia Dalma, this scroll rubbing was obtained from a high-ranked demon, meaning high-ranked demons and even higher-level demons might be looking for the text of this Bible. In other words, low-level demons might not know, but high-level demons probably knew about the existence of the demon Bible. No matter what kind of creature it was, they were born to worship their creator, and demons were absolutely no exceptions. But in the abyss, high-level demons clearly knew that there was a creator, but they had not been able to form a top-down religious order to worship the creator. Was this not a little too strange? Moreover, Judging from the content of this chapter of the Demon Bible, the creator of heaven and the abyss should be the same. Although Roy had not seen the Bible on the side of heaven, the Bible of the human world seemed to be born under the influence of heaven, so it could be used as reference. In the human world, the Bible said that the God of the Holy Trinity was the only true God in the world. So if this was true, then the creator of heaven and the abyss should be God. But demons never recognized that God was the true God, so there was immediate conflict. In particular, there were many versions of sacred scriptures in the human world, leading to the emergence of even more gods, causing confusion. Conversely, if the Bible of the human world came from the influence of heaven, did that mean that the Bible of heaven was also in a disorderly state? As he thought about it, Roy suddenly shivered. Damn it! Why does it feel like something is wrong? It seemed like both heaven and the abyss are intentionally downplaying the existence of the true creator. What are they up to? Forget it. This question doesn't seem like something I can touch now. Roy quickly stopped his imagination from running wild. After all, he had only seen some things and could not discern the truth yet. It was meaningless to think about it. After thinking about it, Roy placed his attention on the rubbing of the Bible. After hearing the process of obtaining this rubbing from Tia Dalma, Roy felt that it seemed to contain some mystical powers. The high rank flame demon who originally held the rubbing seemed to be able to interfere with the formation of gates of heaven and gates of the abyss. Roy believed that it was definitely not the power of the flame demon himself, and it was certainly related to the rubbing in front of him. But what should he do? Roy tried to input his magic power into this scroll. Very strange. This scroll seems to be able to carry magic power, but it's like a bottomless pit. No matter how much magic power I input, the scroll isn't reacting. After thinking about it for a while, Roy stopped inputting magic power. This scroll was previously in the hands of Tia Dalma or Calypso. At that time, she would have definitely tried something similar. If just inputting magic power was useful, then Calypso would have long discovered the use of the scroll. Since magic power did not work, he could only use another method. Roy used his nails to slash his palm, creating a wound. Before the wound healed, he quickly dripped some of his demon blood onto the scroll. A strange scene appeared. Roy's demon blood instantly disappeared after dripping onto it. It was as though the scroll absorbed it immediately. The next moment, Roy suddenly felt a burst of fluctuation spreading out in all directions with the scroll as the center. The surrounding objects and scenery shook with the fluctuations. After the fluctuation spread, it quickly calmed down, and there were no more movements from the scroll. Nothing around seemed to have changed, making Roy wonder if he had an illusion just now. What happened? Roy looked around curiously but could not sense anything. Chapter 122 The Prayer of Expelling Angels Roy stood where he was for a while and found that nothing had happened, so he could only try again. He thought that the fluctuations were something like spatial fluctuations, but this time, Roy was prepared and realized that he was mistaken after experimenting again. 
the effect of the fluctuations turned out to be a disturbance to the power of the world. The moment he activated the scroll, Roy found that the repulsive force of the world that had been acting on him all along, and had been continuously strengthening, had an intense change in strength. It suddenly became much stronger before falling back to its original level in an instant. Although this change happened very quickly, he was able to feel it when he sensed it carefully. Roy immediately realized that the effect of activating the scroll was probably another type of expulsion prayer, and it belonged to the expulsion prayer used by demons. This expulsion prayer was not meant to expel demons but to expel angels. This was because it was not just demons who were beings that belonged to another world, but angels were as well, meaning that the repulsive force of a world was not only effective on demons but also on angels. Since there was a special incantation that could trigger the repulsive force of a world to expel demons, then there would also be an incantation that could trigger the repulsive force of a world to expel angels. The reason why that high rank flame demon brought this scroll with him was to use it to fight against angels. After all, compared to low rank demons, high rank demons were more likely to encounter angels when they went to other worlds. Diodalma had said before that in order to resist this high rank flame demon, the people of the church had used a type of magic to pray for an angel to descend. But the summoning was unsuccessful, probably because this high rank flame demon had used the power of this scroll. Such fluctuations in the repulsive force of a world would indeed interfere with the formation of a world teleportation gate. Of course, not only would the gates of heaven not open, but the gates of the abyss would not open either, so that high rank flame demon could not summon other demons to come and help. Moreover, Roy guessed that it was not just the demon's expulsion prayer. Maybe even the expulsion prayer on the side of heaven was the same. They were all indiscriminate attacks that could not distinguish between friend and foe. Any being from another world would be affected. Roy thought of the attacks of the expulsion prayer that he had suffered when he fought against the Spanish Invincible Armada. It was obvious that this expulsion prayer had been sent by angels to humans to let them deal with and expel demons. Because humans were creatures of this world, the repulsive force of the world would not affect them. Therefore, using this expulsion prayer was much more convenient than using angels. This kind of incantation that could invoke the repulsive force of a world was not a type of magic but more inclined to the effects of the spirit of language. Thus, the magic power that Roy had input earlier was just like having it sink into the ocean and did not cause any reaction. Instead, it activated after using demon blood. This might be because the medium of blood could also produce an effect like the power of the spirit of language. However, this method of activating it with blood was probably not the best method to use the expulsion prayer. Otherwise, the repulsive force of the world that Roy felt just now should not have been the same fluctuations as interference, but the kind that continuously strengthened. The best way was probably to chant these words directly. However, this scroll was just a rubbing after all, and the power of the spirit of language attached to it was incomparable to the original version. Moreover, the sixth chapter of this demon Bible was relatively long, and there were some blurry parts in the middle, making it very difficult to recite completely. From the looks of it, this so-called demon Bible still had some unknown effects. Unfortunately, demons had not done well in disseminating it. Not only had they failed to spread the demon Bible to the human world, but many demons in the abyss did not even know of the existence of such a demon Bible. Thus, people had even changed the name of the expulsion prayer to exorcism prayer, thinking that only demons could be expelled, but they did not know that angels could also be expelled. In any case, getting this scroll was an unexpected joy for Roy. This meant that he would have an additional method to fight against angels when he encountered them in the future. In fact, he did not even need to fight against angels. When he saw signs of angels coming, he could directly use this expulsion prayer to prevent angels from coming. Of course, Roy needed to find a way to modify it. Since he knew that the repulsive force of the world could be affected by others, then he could actually create an expulsion prayer himself. But creating something out of thin air consumed a large number of souls so it would be better to use the power on the scroll and modify it directly, which might save a lot. Cassandra was currently processing the slave traders and had not returned, so Roy had nothing to do and decided to start on it. He opened the system interface, found the material he originally had drawn for Frostmourne, and erased the demon characters that he had randomly drawn on the sword. Then he stored the scroll in the system and turned it into a similar material. He then used the clip method to cut out the demon characters on the scroll, placed them on the sword blade, and arranged them. For something like the spirit of language, its power did not come from the carriers but from the character symbols, so the scroll itself was nothing special at all. What was special were the characters on it. Roy's current process was actually like transcribing them. 
This way, it was equivalent to having Frostmourne carry the expulsion prayer, and the original scroll was destroyed. After completing the transcription, Roy defined the attribute. Expulsion, when activating the characters on the sword blade with magic power, the power of the expulsion prayer contained within will activate. The expulsion prayer will not affect the sword wielder. Roy did not specifically define the expulsion prayer and instead used the power of the original characters on the scroll. This way, he would not need to consume additional souls. But when he activated the expulsion prayer, he certainly did not want himself to be affected, so he specially set an exemption for himself. Of course, this was only if he activated the expulsion prayer. If an enemy initiated an expulsion prayer, he would not be able to avoid it. He could not set himself to have complete immunity to the repulsive force of the world because such an attribute definition meant deviating from the rules of the world, and the consumption would definitely be an astounding figure. Even if Roy could circumvent this rule like Caesar and get himself a demon human body, it would not actually be considered immunity to the force of world repulsion because a demon human body could only remain in the current world forever. He would also be repulsed when he entered other worlds. After adding this expulsion attribute, if Roy encountered enemies that were angels or creatures from other worlds in the future, Roy could let them have a taste of being expelled. If the other party did not want to be disturbed by this expelling force, they would have to consume more magic power to resist it, which would invisibly weaken the opponent. After completing it, Roy chose to materialize. Due to him making modifications to the original foundation, Frostmourne did not disappear beforehand. When he materialized, a ray of light flashed on the sword and the original character symbols were erased. Then the character symbols that came from the demon bible slowly emerged on the sword blade. Even though the text was moved onto the sword, its power of the spirit of language did not change. After the text was engraved onto the sword, it still had traces of corrosion, and even the abyss aura contained within it appeared. Now, Roy's Frostmourne not only had the auras of darkness and ice but also the sense of sulfur and flames from the abyss aura. These auras mixed together, but there was no conflict causing Frostmourne to become even more terrifying and strange. Roy raised the sword, looked at it, and found that the system had unexpectedly helped him automatically fill in the unclear words during the materialization. This was equivalent to the current Frostmourne being a new item that had inherited the content of the Demon Bible 6th chapter. Roy had paid more than 1,400 souls for this modification. It almost caught up to the cost of creating Frostmourne. The addition of the text might not have cost too much, but it was relatively expensive to set himself exempt. Of course, Roy could accept this price of souls compared to a self-made expulsion prayer. After Roy completed the modification and stored Frostmourne, Cassandra returned. And beside her were dozens of ghouls that had been transformed from the slave traders. Unlike the priest from the Inquisition, the ghouls transformed from these slave traders were not conscious and completely under Cassandra's control. Cassandra offered all of their souls to Roy. Among them, there were eleven souls that were pitch black fallen souls, possibly from the leaders of the slave traders. Roy was certainly happy to see such fallen souls, because according to the calculations of the Haradra cube, a fallen soul was equivalent to 99 ordinary souls. Eleven fallen souls was equivalent to more than a thousand ordinary souls. These ugly ghouls with saliva dripping from their mouths still had an instinctive fear of Roy when they saw him, and their entire bodies were crawling on the ground. Roy ignored their fear and said to Cassandra, Now, your only target for revenge is your despicable father, right? Yes. Cassandra nodded. In fact, I'm not willing to call him my father. My only relative in this world is my mom. Okay, let's go to Spain. Chapter 123 Departure On the way to Spain, Roy made preparations to fight against the Church of Spain. He had just extinguished one of the fleets of the Spanish Invincible Armada, causing great panic, and he now was going to Spain. It was obvious what a huge impact this would have on the entire country. Spain was now in its decline. England was gradually replacing it as the supreme maritime power, and its control over its colonies was continuously weakening. It could be said that the current British were much smarter than the Spanish. At least, there was a huge difference in their attitudes toward Roy, the demon. Driven by their religious beliefs, the Spanish had launched a fearless war against Roy, but the British pretended as though no demon had ever appeared. They knew that Roy had settled on an island in the Caribbean, but they did not care at all. Even the Royal Navy fleets never went near Roy's waters, so even if Roy wanted to plunder the souls of the Royal Navy, he could not find the target. After the British used the pirates against the Spanish, they planned to use the demon. But this time, they did not get what they wanted. In fact, after the destruction of this fleet of the Invincible Armada, 
All of Spain was shocked. Even though the fanatical believers were clamoring to send a more powerful fleet to kill the demon, the aristocrats realized that if they continued to fight against demon Osiris, before the British rose, the Spanish might lose their country. They did not have that many ships in the invincible armada that they could destroy the demon. Therefore, this time, they not only forcefully suppressed the voices of the fanatics, but they also specially investigated the identity of the Lich Cassandra. When they discovered that Lich Cassandra was only born because of a mistaken witch hunt, the aristocrats of Spain hated the church to death. The innocent woman who was burned to death as a witch had died, but her daughter escaped and even attracted a demon from hell. If they had known that things would develop this way, it would have been better not to have hunted witches. During the investigation of Cassandra's identity, they also found Cassandra's father, the despicable drunkard who had falsely accused his wife. The aristocrats did not dare to criticize the church for its actions, but they tacitly worked with the church to vent their anger on this man. They caught Cassandra's father and then hanged him like a pirate. The body of this villain was placed in the port of Spain's largest port city, hung in the most conspicuous position for an entire week. Not only that, but the news of the execution of this man was posted everywhere in the country. The Spanish ruling class was terrified. Of course, they understood that demon Osiris was helping Lich Cassandra take revenge. They had already guessed that there might be a demon contract between the Lich and the demon, so it was very likely that the demon and the Lich would go to Spain. In order to prevent a battle with the demon from happening again, they had to use this method to convey their attitude. Yes, you see, we've hanged your bastard father, and you've already taken revenge, so please don't bring your demon master here anymore, alright? They had indeed conveyed their attitude. The moment Roy brought Cassandra onto Spain, Cassandra saw this execution notice. She recognized her father from the portrait and stood in front of it for a long time without saying a word. In fact, Cassandra had yet to find her hometown at this time because she did not remember where it was at all. It was just a small town close to the coast in Spain. As for the town in the notice, all the houses had already closed their doors, and there was not even a dog in sight in this town with tens of thousands of people. People were hiding in their homes, trembling and praying non-stop, praying that the demon and lich would not enter the town. After a long time, Cassandra said to Roy, Forget it. Let's go back, master. Since he's dead, then my hatred is gone. During this time, the power of hatred in Cassandra had been eliminated with her revenge, so Roy did not say anything after feeling her emotions. With Cassandra's words, the demon contract Roy and Cassandra signed suddenly appeared and slowly burned under the flames of hell. This meant that the contract between Roy and Cassandra was fulfilled. Without the demon contract, the repulsive force of the world on Roy suddenly increased substantially, and Roy had to burn his magic power to resist this repulsive force. He estimated that he could probably stay in this world for two more weeks with the current repulsive force. Therefore, Roy brought Cassandra back to Frozen Island and planned to find a way to strengthen her before he left. Of course, he had never thought about consuming souls to make items. There was no need for that. He just looked for some mysterious legends about black magic in this world and then collected some items with magic power. Finally, Roy found a ruby with a cursing power and a few finger bones that pirates said were from a vampire. He combined these things together, made a staff, and gave it to Cassandra. During this time, although Roy did not deliberately plunder souls, there were still some souls that appeared in front of him every day. Roy knew that the demon gold he had left in this world was starting to take effect. In fact, the Osiris mark on the demon gold had taken effect faster than Roy had imagined. On the night the pirates brought by Tia Dalma had left, twenty souls had teleported to Roy. This was because, as expected, the pirates began infighting not long after they left. Some of the pirates who had received less gold joined forces secretly, killed a small part of the people on the pirate ship, took the gold in their hands, and split it again. Whether it was the power of the curse of misfortune on gold that caused these pirates to die, or whether it was purely because of the envy and greed of human nature, even Roy could not tell. The pirates only knew that gold had the power to cause others to be unlucky, but they did not know the function of the Osiris mark. They did not know that the gold would make their souls fall into the hands of the demon after their deaths. They were already blinded by the gold and fortune and could no longer think about other issues. As the remaining pirates reached shore, the gold quickly started circulating. The pirates could not tell others that gold would bring misfortune because they were afraid that people would be scared of the curse and refuse to accept the gold when they bought things. Thus, the pirates concealed this secret in unison, only declaring to others that this was the reward given to them by the demon after they presented the murderers. 
This declaration made the pirates who were timid and had not dared to go beat their chests and stamp their feet in regret. The pirates who had successfully brought back the gold became truly successful people. Even though many of them were constantly unlucky because they had the gold, they were still bragging incessantly about their experience in front of others. They told people about the huge frozen mountain where the demons settled and what they had seen, such as Lich Cassandra turning people into ghouls. Even though they had not seen the scene of Cassandra transforming the ghouls and were boasting, they were unexpectedly very close. This made people have no choice but to admire their imagination. The gold with the snowflake mark quickly spread, and some people even used this gold to show off. Even though in the following days, some of the people who had come into contact with this gold had died because of bad luck, people did not think toward a curse at all. Wealth would drive people crazy. Perhaps it would take a long time for the people of this world to discover the truth about the gold of misfortune. At this time, Roy quietly left the pirates of the Caribbean world, leaving behind only a legend about the demon's treasure. Perhaps one day, someone would attempt to summon the demon named Osiris through a black magic ritual based on this legend. Chapter 124 Limit The moment he returned to the abyss, breathed the unique hot air, and saw the dark environment, Roy suddenly felt that the abyss seemed to be a little different. It did not mean that the environment of the abyss had changed, but Roy himself felt different. The environment of the abyss was harsh and cruel. Even though demons could adapt to this environment, it did not mean that cruelty did not exist. In the past, Roy had always felt depressed when he was in the abyss, which was caused by the scorching air and dark environment of this world. But this time, after returning to the abyss, he found that this depression not only disappeared but was also replaced with relaxation. How should he describe it? It was as though he had soaked in a bathtub full of hot water after an exhausting day or had a happy ending at the spa, feeling refreshed all over. This feeling made Roy feel very strange. He found that the magic power in his body was operating smoother, and the energy of his entire body seemed to have improved. This was something that had never happened before. Is it because of the so-called chosen one of the abyss talent? Roy guessed. It seems to have improved my affinity with the abyss. To be honest, Roy had yet to figure out what this additional talent ability was about. When he was in the Pirates of the Caribbean world, he had not noticed this talent having any function. But now that he was back in the abyss, the effect immediately appeared. Roy spread his demon wings and flew into the sky. Fat Tiger followed closely behind. One demon and one dog returned to their territory. Roy's territory had been transformed by his frost power, and there was still some frost magic power left. Although the flames and scorching heat had corroded his territory after he had been away for a long time, other demons had not occupied this place. When Roy returned, the remaining frost elements in the area began to become active again. Roy did not stand on ceremony. He immediately used his magic power to freeze his territory. When the solid black ice appeared, an even more magical scene appeared. The fire elements in the surroundings actually began to avoid Roy's territory and a large amount of dark and frost elements began gathering around Roy. This phenomenon had not happened in the past either. In the past, Roy's territory had always been corroded by flames and scorching heat. After all, the power of frost and the environment of the abyss were opposites. Roy had been using this method to train his magic power, but now, this corrosion was gone. This discovery puzzled Roy as he touched his demon horns. He knew that it was probably caused by the Chosen One talent. The advantage was that without the interference of the fire elements, Roy's frost magic power normalized in the abyss, but the disadvantage was that he could no longer use the environment to temper his frost power. After thinking about it for a while, Roy decided not to care that much. In any case, the current level of activity of the frost element could probably make up for it. Back in his lair, Roy began to calculate his harvest from the pirates of the Caribbean world. Of the two biggest waves of souls that he had harvested, one was from the Pirate Lord of the Black Sea's fleet, and the other was from the Spanish Invincible Armada. In the battles with these two forces, Roy obtained more than 23,400 souls, and with 300 to 400 other scattered souls he harvested, the total added up to 23,800. However, despite having obtained so many souls, he also used up some. Among them, the most expensive was the creation of the Osiris Mark, costing a full 5,000. Later, he used about 1,400 to modify Frostmourne with the expulsion attribute. As a result, he only had around 17,400 souls left. Moreover, there were also the 11 fallen souls. It could be said that his harvest was quite fruitful. As the power of a demon increased, the efficiency of harvesting souls would naturally increase. 
low rank demons could only kill one by one to obtain souls. But after becoming middle rank demons, their magic power and magical destructiveness increased, so the speed of harvesting souls also greatly increased. However, as the efficiency increased, the growth rate of magic power subsequently decreased. There was nothing he could do about this. Since they were in the abyss, there were many worlds that demons could come into contact with. Perhaps to humans, the world they lived in was their home, but to demons, it was just one of the countless worlds. A world was just a number and not necessarily very precious, so out of the desire for souls, it could be said that every demon had the heart to destroy a world because this meant that they would be able to obtain a lot of souls. Of course, it was one thing to want to destroy a world, but it was another thing to be able to do it. Without enough strength, it was useless to think much about it. Although Roy had harvested many souls in the Pirates of the Caribbean world this time, he still finally stopped before going too far. It might have looked as though existences like Calypso and Davy Jones had turned a blind eye to Roy's actions, but in fact, it was because they could not do anything about Roy. They simply felt that starting a fight with Roy was not cost-effective and risky, so they had let Roy do what he wanted. However, if Roy had been greedy and wanted to plunder more souls, these people might have turned hostile. With more than 17,000 souls in his hands, Roy naturally began to consider how to strengthen himself. In the display of the system interface, his current magic power value was 3,122. This magic power value was already at the level of a top middle rank demon, but it was still a distance away from the level of a high rank demon. Thus, it was certain that he would set aside some souls to continue increasing his magic power. However, even if his magic power reached the level of a high rank demon, it might not necessarily be possible for him to become a high rank demon immediately. Roy's demon bloodline needed to have enough purity. As his magic power grew, Roy's frost power also grew, which was the indication that his bloodline was continuing to purify. This was the way demons improved, simple and crude. They only needed to devour enough souls. After thinking about it, Roy decided to set aside 10,000 souls to make magic energy growth potions to enhance his magic power and purify his bloodline. He intended to use the remaining 7,400 souls to improve his defensive capabilities. But considering that his current magic power growth efficiency was declining, Roy did not turn these 10,000 souls into a bottle of magic energy growth potion. Instead, he used 100 souls each bottle and observed the changes in his magic power growth efficiency through consuming them several times. At first, a bottle of magic energy growth potion made with 100 souls could increase Roy's magic power by 72 after consuming it. But when his magic power increased to 3,500, it was as Roy had expected. The efficiency of the potions fell again, and a bottle could only increase his magic power by 68. After reaching 4,000, a bottle could only increase it by 65. At this time, Roy understood why demons pursued high-quality souls. As the magic power growth rate using ordinary souls decreased, the growth in magic power brought by consuming high-quality souls like fallen souls seemed much higher. A fallen soul could substitute for nearly a hundred souls, so its efficiency was naturally higher. However, high-quality souls such as fallen souls were relatively rare, so these souls were quite precious to other demons. But for Roy, because he had created the Haradric Cube, he could transmute ordinary souls into high-quality fallen souls, which was very unusual. Roy continued downing magic energy growth potions. He initially thought that even if the efficiency fell, his magic power would still slowly increase. But he did not expect that when his magic power reached 5000, an unexpected situation happened. He discovered that the magic power nodes all over his body felt swollen and painful. Realizing that something might have gone wrong, Roy immediately stopped consuming the potions. What's going on? Has the magic power within my body reached the limit, or is it because of something else? Chapter 125 Second Gear Roy could only stop because of the abnormal condition of his body. He began to check his physical condition but was surprised to find that his magic power was running through the nodes in his body very smoothly, as smoothly as usual. There was not the slightest stagnation at all. But once Roy tried to take another magic energy growth potion, that painful swelling appeared again. This made Roy realize that his current magic power seemed to have reached a limit. In fact, as early as when his magic power reached about 3000, Roy noticed that the number of magic power nodes in his body no longer increased with the increase of his magic power. That meant that the magic power circuit possessed by the frost demon bloodline had been completely constructed in Roy's body. But this situation had not attracted Roy's attention at that time. The bodies of demons were special. 
they used their hearts as the energy center for magic power, and then they used the magic power nodes all over their bodies to form a unique, network-like magic power circuit. Magic power was a type of invisible and intangible energy, and it did not have any attributes at all. When demons cast magic, magic power first poured out from their hearts and quickly transferred through each magic power node. After activating the entire magic power circuit, the attributeless magic power would transform into elemental energy and finally form magical energy with an attribute. Take Roy for example. The magic energy growth potions he produced using the energy of souls was actually pure, attributeless magic power. After consuming the magic energy growth potions, Roy's body would absorb the magic power within and store it in his heart. This was the so-called growth of magic power. This was the so-called growth of magic power. Roy's magic power circuit was dark cold, which could be regarded as a kind of mutated magic power circuit and different from the ones of other frost demons. When he wanted to activate ice magic, magic power would quickly surge out from his heart, activate his mutated magic power circuit, and transform the attributeless magic power into magic power with both the dark and frost attributes. The description of this process might be rather verbose, but it was actually completed in a rather short amount of time. It could be said that it was so fast that it was almost impossible to detect, almost instinctively. This way, Roy could use the dark cold energy as he wanted. The same was true for other demons, whether they were demons using flame powers or dark powers. Different demon bloodlines brought about different magic power circuits. Roy's problem now was that there was nothing wrong with his entire magic power circuit, but it seemed like the magic power volume of his heart had reached its limit. Roy unconsciously wagged his tail and touched his demon horns as he started to ponder. During this period of time, Roy did not know if it was an illusion or not, but he felt that his demon horns were becoming better and better to the touch, especially the parts close to his head. They felt warm, as though he was touching a warm piece of jade. Whenever he had this feeling, Roy could not help but want to get a mirror to take care of them and see if they were already patinating. Having said that, he had come into contact with many demons in the middle abyss, and he found that many demons cared a lot about their demon horns. Both male and female demons were like this. Unless absolutely necessary, they would not use their demon horns as weapons. Hmm, it seems like we've digressed. Roy stopped letting his thoughts wander and began to consider how to solve his current situation. Clearly, a magic power value of 5000 was not the limit. In Roy's impression, High-ranked demons like Xeron had a massive amount of magic power that definitely exceeded 5,000. Then, how did those high-ranked demons store more magic power? This question was also probably another obvious difference between middle-ranked demons and high-ranked demons. Increasing the number of hearts, such as turning a heart into two or three? This might indeed increase the number of magic power reserves, but after thinking about it, Roy tossed this thought out of his mind. He felt that, other than some demons with special abilities, most demons could not control how their bodies grew, and it was impossible for more hearts to grow out of thin air. This thing isn't a tumor. A bigger body? That doesn't seem right. A larger body did not mean a larger heart, thus being able to contain more magic power. A larger body contained more blood, but magic power was not blood. The so-called magic power volume was just a concept, and its storage method was different from that of blood. If this were the case, all high-ranked demons would probably be giant creatures about 50 meters tall and have 50 meter waist circumferences. Roy thought of several solutions, but finally, the only method he felt reliable was compression. The reason was very simple. Everyone knew that in the case of an object with a fixed volume, the higher the density, the heavier it was. It would probably be the same when it came to magic power. If he could compress his magic power and reduce the volume it occupied in his heart, it might be able to free up some space to accommodate the further growth of magic power. The more he thought about it, the more he felt that this was the right idea, so he could not wait to start experimenting. But after trying, Roy realized that it was much more difficult to compress magic power than he thought. Magic power was invisible and intangible, and it was extremely difficult to affect externally, let alone compress. Roy tried for a long time but to no avail, making him slightly crazy and even wanting to use the system to solve this problem. However, he only had this thought but did not really do so because he felt that there was no need to waste his souls on this kind of thing. In any case, he had just returned to the abyss from the pirates of the Caribbean world, so he had plenty of time to experiment slowly and experience the joy of training. Hmm, come to think of it, isn't this like cultivation in novels? It's just that they're doing immortal cultivation, and I'm doing. Demon cultivation. Over the coming days, 
Besides taking Fat Tiger out to hunt monsters and obtain souls every day, Roy spent the rest of his time trying to compress his magic power. But in the end, Roy realized that he was taking the wrong direction after testing various methods. As mentioned earlier, it was extremely difficult to use external force to affect magic power. Instead, he could achieve this by taking advantage of the characteristics of magic power itself. The method Roy finally found was actually very simple. It was to use the characteristic of magic power being able to flow smoothly in the circuit and repeatedly expanding and shrinking the magic power in the circuit. When expanding, he pushed it to the limit as much as possible so that his magic power would spread evenly to every node in the circuit. When shrinking, he would try to shrink it to the limit and not let any leak out at all. During the entire process of releasing and retracting, it should be as fast as possible, and he had to complete 10 or more cycles in a second. This entire process slightly resembled the process of blood spreading in his body. He treated the magic power center in the demon heart as a pressure pump to push the magic power out before taking it back again. Increasing the frequency of the cycles was equivalent to increasing the frequency of his heart beating and constantly increasing the magic power excitement in his body. Roy called this entire process second gear. After doing this tempering method for a while, Roy was happy to find that his magic power was really starting to become denser. This was because his magic power became more tense during the process of shrinking and expanding, so he could gradually begin to compress it. Of course, Roy's current magic power of 5000 was considered a large amount of magic power, and it would take him a long time to compress this much magic power completely. Time did not matter. To Roy, a demon, time was now probably his least valuable thing. Roy got down to tempering and compressing his magic power. What he did not know was that despite him feeling that it was not easy to find this way of compressing magic power, for many middle rank demons, let alone spending a few days of experimenting to find this method, even a few years might not necessarily be enough. Why were there so few high rank demons? The reason was that not only did they have to purify their bloodlines, but they also needed to find a way to compress their magic power and increase their magic power capacity. Many middle ranks might accomplish the first point since all they needed to do was to just keep devouring souls, but 99% were stuck on the latter one. Higher rank demons were already members of the ruling class of the Abyss, so it was impossible for them to spread the method of promoting to high rank demon. Unless it was for their offsprings, in which case they might give a hint or two when leaving the memory inheritance. And those demons with the bloodline of high rank demons would also treasure these memories and not easily tell others. This was a unique monopolistic behavior of the demon elite. It was precisely because of this that many demons were stuck at the top middle rank and could not promote. But when it came to Roy, it seemed so. Logical. He wanted to compress his magic power, and after experimenting with it for a while, he actually did it. He did not feel much about it himself, but if other middle rank demons had seen his entire exploration process, they would probably find it unbelievable because it went so smoothly that it was terrifying. And all of this seemed to be caused by his so-called chose one of the abyss talent. Chapter 126 Old Friend As Roy began continuously compressing his magic power, his body gradually showed some special changes. The most notable thing was his feet. Roy did not know what happened to them, but every step Roy took now left a black frost footprint the same size as his feet on the ground. In particular, when he walked on relatively hot ground, the frost footprints would evaporate from the ground heat and cause a mist to curl up. This phenomenon was very strange because Roy was certain that he had not deliberately focused his magic power on his feet. But even so, when he did not control it while walking, it caused a series of frost footprints. It usually took 5 to 6 minutes before they slowly dissipated. It was as though it was. Instinctual. Roy studied it and felt that it was probably related to his frost demon bloodline. Perhaps this change was brought about by the gradually condensing magic power stimulating his demon bloodline. And it seemed like as his magic power continued to compress, the frost footprints left behind would become more obvious and last longer. In addition to the frost footprints, another special change was that Roy found himself emanating a sense of pressure. This pressure was exactly the same as what he felt on Xeron back then, and it seemed to have the effect of deterring and suppressing low-level demons. Before, Roy had always thought that this pressure came from the bloodline of high-ranked demons, but now that he had this pressure, he realized that he was wrong. This pressure was actually caused by stronger and denser magic power. This made Roy even more certain that he was on the right path to promoting to high rank demon. The pressure emanating from him was still relatively weak because his magic power had yet to be condensed completely. Therefore, the other middle rank demons in the same level of the abyss could not feel it, 
but the low-ranked demons in the upper abyss would probably feel it clearly. During the next two months, Roy spent most of his time in his lair, constantly compressing and tempering his magic power. This was a relatively long-term process because it would become more and more difficult during the latter half. Roy did not dare to slack off, so he gave the task of mining the entire gold mine to Fat Tiger. During these two months, souls had been teleporting to Roy from time to time. Needless to say, they must have teleported from the pirates of the Caribbean world due to someone dying near the gold with the Osiris mark. In just two months, Roy collected more than 70 such souls. Among them, there was a wave of 15 souls teleporting over together. Who knew if people were fighting over the gold? Roy's attribute for the Osiris mark was to teleport souls near the gold. This meant that even if people did not die because of the gold's curse of misfortune, as long as they died within the range of the gold, the Osiris mark would capture the souls. Therefore, even though Roy had spent 5,000 souls to create the Osiris mark, it was very worthwhile since he would obtain lifelong benefits from this investment. Now that he saw benefits, Roy naturally could not let it go. He regarded the huge gold mine as his private property and had Fat Tiger mine it every day. Poor Fat Tiger had completely turned into a coolie during this time, going out early and returning late every day. Not only did he have to exhaust himself to drag back the heavy gold ore, but he also had to constantly squeeze out his magic power and spit out hellfire to smelt the demon gold. Fortunately, Roy felt sorry for him. Every time he returned, Roy prepared a feast for him. Not only did he eat to his fill, but he also had a lot of souls to replenish his magic power. From time to time, when Roy stopped cultivating, he would run around with Fat Tiger and give him a massage. Over the past two months, not only had Roy's magic power tempering been fruitful, but even Fat Tiger had become much stronger. In the system interface, Fat Tiger's attributes had improved a lot, and he was already at the level of a middle-middle rank demon. In fact, due to Fat Tiger being born from Gabriel's soul fragment, the holy souls of angels would give Fat Tiger the greatest enhancements. Ordinary souls had a much smaller enhancement effect, and he was only able to grow to this extent thanks to Roy's continuous feeding. Fat Tiger's body was now over 2.6 meters long, and he was about 1.7 meters tall when standing on the ground. The bulging muscles all over his body, his sharp fangs and claws that had become sharper from digging ores, and the hell flames that he emitted occasionally made him look magnificent. Any demon that saw Fat Tiger would think that he was one of the elite and outstanding hellhounds. On this day, Fat Tiger followed his usual routine. He first dragged back a cart full of ore back from the gold mine and piled it in the lair. Then he bit the ropes of the small mine cart that Roy made and dragged it back to the gold mine. However, before Fat Tiger could continue digging the gold door with his claws, his three heads sniffed curiously at the same time. Fat Tiger's sense of smell was very sensitive, and he found a strange smell floating in the air of the mine. Not only did this scent smell of sulfur and fire, but it also had the smell of blood. When Fat Tiger realized that another demon had appeared in the mine, he immediately put his guard up, bent down, sniffed the source of the smell, and quietly looked for it. Hellhounds had always been in the abyss, and they were existences like hunters. Their bodies and foot pads made them very good at sneak attacks. Even though Fat Tiger looked huge, he could make no sounds when he moved. As long as the demon that entered the mine was not a hellhound, it would be difficult for the other party to discover him. Yes, Fat Tiger planned to drive this demon away for his master Roy first. However, when Fat Tiger found the intruding demon, he discovered that it was bigger than him. This demon was a huge spider demon that was about 3 meters tall. Its upper body was that of a female demon, and she had no demon horns, but there was a pair of huge pincers on both sides of her mouth. Her stomach was a round and fat spider abdomen, and on her abdomen was a pattern that looked like a demon face, supported by eight legs full of long hair. When Fat Tiger found this spider demon, he found that she was actually building a nest. The end of her abdomen was constantly spraying out a transparent liquid, and after the liquid touched the air, it gradually turned into white spider silks. The spider demon used these spider silks to weave a large spider web between the stalactites and stalagmites in a cave. Seeing this, Fat Tiger was furious. Not only did Roy treat the gold mine as his private property, but even Fat Tiger was no exception. Now someone actually dared to build a nest in his territory? Fat Tiger suddenly sprang out from the dark. One of his heads opened its mouth wide, and black hellfire immediately sprayed onto the spider demon. The moment the hellfire touched the spider web, it immediately ignited, and the spider demon on it fell with a loud thud. She screamed and rolled on the ground in an attempt to extinguish the flames on her. But how could hellfire be so easy to extinguish? 
It kept burning her body and making crackles. Ah! The spider demon screamed while trying to stand up after realizing that she could not extinguish the flames. She opened her mouth, and dark green venom sprayed at Fat Tiger. Fat Tiger leapt lightly to avoid the enemy's venom. But something went wrong. Fat Tiger did not expect the spot he landed to have some webs left on the ground, which might have been from when the spider demon was building her nest. As soon as Fat Tiger stepped on it, he became stuck and stopped his movements. Taking advantage of this moment, the spider demon's abdomen sprayed out the transparent liquid. The liquid became a huge white spider web in the air and went toward Fat Tiger. Fat Tiger was trapped and could not move for a while. The spider demon was still burning with hell flames, but she was moving her legs and rushing up. Her entire body had a burnt smell from the hellfire scorching her. The spider demon looked at Fat Tiger with hatred. She raised a sharp long leg and prepared to kill Fat Tiger. However, right at this moment, a burst of cold air suddenly spread. Fat Tiger spat out a large amount of frosted spiderweb under him, instantly freezing the spiderweb, and then he shook it violently, shattering the spiderweb like glass. The next second, Fat Tiger jumped up fiercely and actually landed on the neck of the spider demon's upper body. Then he opened a mouth, and one of his heads bit the spider demon's neck. With a loud crash, the two huge creatures fell onto the ground. Fat Tiger landed on all fours, and his strength completely overwhelmed the spider demon. His sharp teeth bit into the spider demon's neck but failed to kill her in one shot. After landing, Fat Tiger wanted to shake his head violently and tear her neck open. But somehow, under the crisis of survival, this spider demon accurately predicted the directions that Fat Tiger's head would swing in. The eight legs under her started moving quickly so that her body moved along with Fat Tiger, making it difficult for Fat Tiger to exert his strength. Spare me. I was wrong. I'll leave now. Please don't kill me. The spider demon wailed as she moved. It was impossible for her not to beg for mercy. This spider demon had just promoted to middle rank demon. Although she was huge, she found that this smaller hellhound was even stronger than her when she confronted him. Moreover, her vital point was controlled, so how could she not beg for mercy? Upon hearing the spider demon begging for mercy, Fat Tiger thought for a while before stepping back and dragging the spider demon toward the entrance of the gold mine. When he moved, the spider demon could only move along to prevent herself from being injured. Under normal circumstances, Fat Tiger would not kill a creature on his own accord because the soul would become exposed after he killed it, and he would not devour the soul without Roy's command. Therefore, in a situation like this, Fat Tiger would choose to hand it over to Roy to have him take care of it. Fat Tiger bit a spider demon bigger than him left the gold mine, and headed toward Roy's lair while dragging the spider. When he arrived at the lair, Roy was a little stunned at this strange scene. He did not expect that Fat Tiger could hunt such a large prey alone. I beg you. Please let me go. Fat Tiger was biting the spider demon's neck, so she was facing down and could not see the situation in front of her. However, she never stopped begging. It was rather rare for a demon to beg like this in the abyss. After all, begging meant giving in and this was not the style of demons. But when the voice fell into Roy's ears, Roy felt that it was vaguely familiar, so he got Fat Tiger to let go of the spider demon. When the spider demon raised her head, Roy found her even more familiar after looking at the human part of the spider demon. Your. Arania? Roy thought for a while before finally calling out the spider demon's name. The spider demon was desperately pressing on her wounds to stop the bleeding. After hearing Roy's words, she was stunned. She looked carefully at Roy and asked in confusion, I am Arania, but who are you? Have we met? Chapter 127 The Queen of Spiders, Loth That's right. This spider demon in front of Roy was his first neighbor, Arania, in the upper abyss. At that time, Roy was merely a low-rank demon. He could not defeat Arania and was almost eaten. But unexpectedly, fortunes had reversed. Roy had already become a top middle-rank demon and was climbing toward becoming a high-rank demon but Arania had just promoted to middle rank demon. Through the spiritual connection, Roy learned the whole story from Fat Tiger. He looked at Arania and was slightly dumbfounded. He did not expect that when Arania appeared in front of him again, she actually planned to be his neighbor again. Moreover, she was so unlucky that the location she chose for her nest was in the gold mine. Roy did not know what to say. What an ill-fated relationship. The abyss was so vast, yet he had encountered the same demon on two different levels. Roy could not even figure out how low the probability was, but as it happened, he and Arania met again. 
Roy recognized Arania because her overall change was not too big despite advancing. But Arania did not recognize Roy. Roy looked completely different from when he was the red-skinned little demon. Even though Arania had a deep impression of the little demon that suddenly grew a pair of demon wings on the lava river, she was not able to connect him with Roy's current appearance. Roy stood up and walked toward Arania. Arania hurriedly lowered her body to express her surrender when she saw Roy approaching. She could already tell that this hellhound, who had bitten her and dragged her here, was the servant of this frost demon. Judging from this, this frost demon was stronger than the hellhound. Arania felt that she was not his match, and she was a spider demon. The demons of her race were cunning and treacherous in nature, and they would not be as rash and reckless as those demons who only knew how to use their muscles. So seeing that the situation was not right, she immediately gave in. Actually, Arania was quite depressed. Although she had only been a low-ranked demon in the upper abyss, she was still in existence that stood at the top. Not many demons could defeat her, and she could get any prey she wanted as she wanted. Life had been very satisfactory. But unexpectedly, after she came to the middle abyss and promoted with great difficulty, she was suddenly at the bottom of the food chain, and anyone could bully her. Even though she knew that this situation was the same for many demons, the psychological difference was still huge, and it was difficult for her to adapt to this sudden change. However, a demon's life was hard, and she had to adapt to it no matter how difficult it was. Therefore, when Roy came to her, she not only lowered her body but also tried to please him. Your Excellency, Arania greets you. Pardon my ignorance, but I really can't remember where I met you. But since you know me, please let me off this time on account of the fact that we're acquaintances. While talking, she straightened her body and said bluntly, If you need to vent, I will do my best to serve you. These words made Roy's face darken. Which one of your eyes sees that I need to vent? Also, why are you so confident in your free, black-haired covered body? Shut up. Say another word, and I'll tear you into pieces. Roy felt disgusted, so he simply shouted coldly. Fat Tiger growled cooperatively at the side, his three heads and six eyes staring intently at Arania's neck. Yes. Arania trembled. She saw that Roy was unhappy and quickly lowered her head. When did you come to this level of the abyss? Roy asked coldly. A about two months ago. Arania answered honestly, completely without the arrogance that she used to have in the upper abyss. Two months ago is about the time that I just returned. He sized her up and asked, That's strange. When you were a low-ranked demon, you had the form of a spider demon. Why do you still look like this after promoting to middle-ranked demon? Your Excellency, you probably don't know that the spider demon bloodline has always been one of the more powerful bloodlines in the abyss. Orania replied, If there isn't a stronger bloodline, then the demons born are usually in the form of spider demons. Even when promoting, most of them awaken the spider demon bloodline, so the demons of our race generally don't change their appearances too much after being born. The spider demon bloodline is very strong? Roy touched his demon horns. So, your race's bloodline is relatively pure, and it should be easier for you to become a high-ranked demon? No, it's the opposite. Orania was dejected. Most spider demons will probably stop at middle-ranked demon in their lifetimes because... Despite the spider demon bloodline being strong and easy to refine, hunting souls is not the strength of spider demons. So it's very difficult to match up to other demons in terms of magic power growth. Roy was curious, so he asked in detail and finally understood what Arania meant. The reason was very simple. It was because of the habits of spider demons. As a spider demon, Arania was very good at using spider webs to make traps. But this hunting style of waiting for prey was a passive hunting method. When lucky, you might be able to catch some prey in your spider web. But when unlucky, you often waited for a long time without harvesting anything. Furthermore, spider demons could not use the common elemental magic. In addition to their spider web technique, their forte was in curse magic and poison magic. These spells had a shortcoming, they tended to be for weakening others. They were not the kind of destructive magic that could cause large scale damage, so spider demons could not obtain souls in large quantities. Other than that, Spider demons also had the biggest shortcoming being lazy. They could stay motionless on their spider webs for a month or two, willing to wait for prey to run into their spider webs, but unwilling to move their feet and run a bit farther away to hunt. Therefore, spider demons were relatively slow at acquiring souls. In the face of the ever increasing demand for magic power, they felt that they were not able to keep up, and promoting to become high level demons would definitely be a long and difficult path. Take Roy for example. Although he had a cheat, his magic power had increased to 5000. 
Not only did he have the help of the magic energy growth potions, but he had also probably used up more than 10,000 souls. Had it been other demons, their consumption of souls would have been at least 70% to 80% more. Spider demons did not have any other way to obtain so many souls apart from relying on the accumulation of time. This was why demons like flame demons were famous in the abyss. Their magic power could cause huge damage, and it was easier for them to harvest souls and promote. Compared to flame demons, the demons of the other races were slower in obtaining souls. You might not be able to tell from Rania's appearance, but she was almost 80 years old. She was able to promote to middle rank demon completely due to accumulating bit by bit over the years. As to why she had appeared in Roy's gold mine, it was because she had passed by and chanced upon this gold mine a few days ago. However, she had entered from the other side of the gold mine, so Fat Tiger had not discovered her. Spider demons were all good at curse spells, so she also noticed the curse of misfortune in the gold ore. At that time, Arania did not pay it much attention. After all, for demons, gold and whatnot, other than some demons that would occasionally use it to make some decorations, was useless. But after Arania left, she suddenly thought about it and came back. Just like what Roy had thought, Arania suddenly wondered if she could use this gold. In fact, as a spider demon, Orania seldomly responded to the summons to go to other worlds because how she hunted souls in other worlds was not much different from in the abyss. But after discovering the gold mine, Orania planned to use the gold door as bait. She did not intend to use the curse of misfortune on it. This curse of misfortune was useless to her. She just planned to put the gold on her spider web to make it easier to beat the greedy humans. While speaking to her, Roy found that Orania's thinking was indeed very clear. She had even been secretly observing Roy but she could not recall who Roy was. After speaking with Arania for a while, Roy suddenly asked, Have you heard of the Demon Bible? This question was very sudden, and Arania was stunned for a moment before she nodded. I know a little. Roy was merely asking casually, but he did not expect Arania to actually know, so he quickly told her to tell him. This is something mentioned in my inherited memories. It's said that it's something in the deeper abyss, and its contents are recorded on seven sealed steelies. Orania said. It's said that the sealed steelies were things left behind by the seven deadly sin demon kings, and there are still mystical powers on them. But this is just a legend. It's too ancient, and it has long been impossible to verify. Your Excellency, why are you asking? It's nothing. I merely heard a legend like this by chance, so I was just asking. Roy said quietly. Come to think of it, you even know such things. Your inherited memories seem very complete. Orania puffed out her chest and said proudly, because the inherited memories of us spider demons come from the Queen of Spiders Loth. She is one of the existing demon kings in the abyss and the greatest existence of the spider demons. Roy was stunned when he heard this and quickly asked, Wait. What did you say? The Queen of Spiders Loth? Are you sure you got it right? Isn't she? Isn't she the goddess of the Dark Elves? How did the Queen of Spiders become a demon? Queen Loth's previous body was a demon. Orania's voice grew louder when it came to the pride of her race. It's just that she used a special method to turn into a half-elf half-demon, so she can only stay in other worlds and can't return to the abyss. The legends of the Dark Elves are wrong. The original body of Queen Loth was a demon, not a Dark Elf. Is that so? Roy did not expect to hear something like this from Orania. In fact, Roy knew that there was such a Queen of Spiders. He could not help it because she was too famous but he had always thought that she was only the goddess of the Dark Elves, and he had never linked it to the spider demons of the Abyss. It was difficult for spider demons to promote, and Arania said this personally. However, it made sense if the Spider Queen Loth really had a body that resembled a half-human half-demon body. Chapter 128 Memory Reading There was a short pause at this point, and the scene fell silent. Arania sized Roy up quietly while feeling uneasy. In fact, when she mentioned Loth, the Queen of Spiders of the Spider Demons, besides explaining the matter about her inheritance, she had the intention of deterring him. The rules of the Abyss were like this. When a demon was defeated and fell into the hands of another demon, the outcome was often predictable. In 90% of cases, there was only death. Orania certainly knew this, but she did not want to die and wanted to struggle. Although the Frost Demon in front of her seemed to know her, Orania did not feel relieved because of this acquaintance relationship. On the contrary, she was even more terrified. Because. Demons did not have friends. The so-called familiarity only had one possibility enemies. Either he had hunted her, or she had hunted him before. 
Orania thought for a while and found that she had no memory of being hunted by a frost demon. In that case, there was only one possibility she had hunted him before. Orania began to tremble slightly at the thought of this. When promoting to middle rank demon, many demons would change their forms because of the bloodline awakening. And what she feared the most was this situation, a prey that escaped from her hunt, after changing appearance, not only came to seek revenge but also was stronger than her, the original hunter. Orania had no other choice but to bring up the name of the Queen of Spiders Loth. In fact, she had nothing to do with the Queen of Spiders at all. She had not even become a subordinate of the Spider Queen. Even though the spider demon bloodline in her body came from Loth, who knew how many generations of descendants it had been, and she fundamentally had no relationship with her at all. She only hoped that she could use Loth's existence as a demon king to awe this frost demon in front of her so that he would not dare to kill her. This was just like how some demons claimed to be the subordinates of certain demon kings. If she wanted to stay alive, she would definitely have to pay a price. As long as she was not killed, she would accept it even if she had to sign a master-servant contract. However, what Araniva did not expect was that an invisible force suddenly strangled her in the next moment. Her huge spider body, which weighed more than a ton, was lifted up by this invisible force. Suspended in the air, Arania was unable to use her strength. Her eight legs kicked desperately as she was being strangled, leaving her unable to breathe and her mind spinning. Needless to say, it was Roy who held her in the air. No. Don't. Orania screamed. Don't kill. Me. Roy sneered as he looked at her. Do you want to say that if I kill you, you'll leave behind a spider demon curse or something on me? And if the spider queen Loth meets me in the future, she'll kill me? Orania was shocked when she heard this. She knew Roy had seen through. As expected. Roy snorted. Sorry, I've killed several spider demons in the middle abyss, but I've never felt any curse on me. Please, I can sign a contract with you and submit to you. Orania did not give up and continued to beg for mercy with difficulty. Keeping me might be useful to you. However, Roy was unmoved and continued tightening the psychokinesis little by little. In the abyss, Roy had long discovered one thing don't easily believe what a demon said, especially the smart and cunning ones. There had been an example before, the illusion demon Caesar. He dared to betray a demon lord and even had the courage to steal something from the demon lord and escape to another world. Even a powerful demon lord had still been betrayed by a demon, let alone Roy, a middle rank demon. The rank gap between Arania and him was not much, so Roy could not believe her at all and would not use her. Even though she was willing to sign a contract, Roy would not do so. Demons were experts at playing with contracts, and he knew that contracts had exploitable loopholes. Roy had too many secrets, so keeping Arania was tantamount to keeping a time bomb. It would be bad if he were to be bitten one day. Moreover, it would be useless for Roy to keep her as his subordinate. Someone who could not even win against Fat Tiger could only be used as cannon fodder. Why should he do that? She even said that it was quite difficult for the spider demons to promote. If Roy took her as his subordinate, would he need to support her in turn? The only thing Arania had that was worthy of Roy's attention was the inherited memories of the spider demons. Because of the strong bloodline of the spider demons, the continuation of the bloodline was quite stable. This might be why the inherited memories were relatively complete. These inherited memories, which contained the experiences of their ancestors and their understanding of the abyss, was the most useful thing for Roy. Roy's short consideration just now was about this. During his conversation with Arania, when Roy was asking about the demon Bible, he was actually thinking about whether to ask about the chosen one of the abyss. But he gave up after giving it some thought. He felt that his talent was truly strange and probably not suitable for other demons to know. But not being able to ask did not mean that he could not learn it from the inherited memories of other demons. The inherited memories were engraved in the depths of a demon's soul. Since Roy wanted Arania's complete inherited memories, he first had to obtain Arania's soul. Back when Roy was a little demon, he was hunted down by Arania and almost died. Roy had vowed to go back and take revenge. Now that he had met her here, he would take revenge on her as well. Orania stopped pleading. She could see strong murderous intentions in Roy's eyes and immediately knew that Roy had made up his mind. No amount of begging would work, so she simply gritted her teeth and fought back. The end of her abdomen suddenly curved and launched spider webs at Roy one after another. However, this struggle was destined to be futile. When the spider webs were about to wrap around Roy, Roy suddenly disappeared from where he was. He activated Flash and easily appeared beside Arania. But his psychokinesis on Arania did not stop. 
When she realized that the spider webs did not work, Arania used all her strength to chant a short curse hoarsely and cast a blindness curse on Roy. The curse actually worked, causing darkness to appear in front of Roy's eyes and making him unable to see anything. However, demons were all of the dark attribute and were naturally resistant to curses. If Arania were stronger than Roy, then the curse might last for a while, just like the weakness curse Zeron cast on Roy in the past. But unfortunately, Arania was weaker than Roy, so the blindness curse failed in less than three seconds. The blindness was very short, but it still stunned Roy for a moment. This gave Arania the opportunity to break free from the control of Roy's psychokinesis. She was also clever. After breaking free, she immediately shot a spider web at Fat Tiger beside her and then quickly started running away. She had stopped Fat Tiger and delayed Roy with the blindness curse. When he regained his senses, Arania had run tens of meters away. If Arania had some more time, she might have really been able to escape. But a distance of tens of meters was clearly not enough. An icebound strike flew from behind and hit her feet, and the powerful frost power from the explosion instantly froze all eight of her legs. Orania could not move at all. Roy slowly flew over and cut her head with Frostmorn. Orania's head was flying in the air, but she still had some consciousness. When her eyes caught sight of Roy's demon wings, Orania suddenly remembered who Roy was. It's. It's you. Orania's head fell on the ground, her eyes full of disbelief as she said the last words in her life. Seems like you remember now. Roy replied with a sneer, but Arania could no longer hear him. Her huge body, which was as large as a tank, crashed to the ground and trembled as a ball of light slowly floated out of her body. Roy reached out and grabbed Arania's soul. Looks like it's time to design a memory reading skill. Roy looked at the soul and then at the Arania's corpse and turned to Fat Tiger. Do you want to eat it? Fat Tiger's three heads all shook at the same time and barked at Roy in unison. Her body is poisonous and disgusting? No wonder there's a rotten smell. After hearing this, Roy did not force the picky eater Fat Tiger and ordered him to throw Orania's corpse farther away while he returned to the lair. Orania's soul was only an ordinary soul, nothing special. The souls of low and middle rank demons seem to be ordinary ones. Only at high rank demon would there be some changes. When Zeron was killed and expelled by the dragons, Roy had seen his soul being exposed. It was very different and Roy did not know what the system would define it as. Holding Arania's soul, Roy spent three high-quality fallen souls, from the slave traders, to create a soul memory reading skill. Soul memory reading, use magic power to read all the memories contained in the soul. This skill was very simple and did not require any special effects. It was just a simple definition. But maybe because it had to do with souls, it had required more fallen souls to make and it also consumed a lot of Roy's magic power when reading memories. Holding Arania's soul, Roy used his skill and began searching the soul's inherited memories for memories of the Chosen One of the Abyss. Chapter 129 Untitled As the memory reading skill carried on, a large amount of knowledge hidden deep within Arania's soul began continuously drilling into Roy's mind. And as he read these memories, Roy's expression kept changing. Just like Roy had expected, the inherited memories of the spider demon were very complete because Arania had a very clear understanding of the abyss in her memories. Through Arania's memory, Roy learned that this so-called abyss was not a planet like he had imagined, but a special domain that ordinary people could never understand. The abyss was in a cut-off place between time and space, but it was not restricted by space and time. It was at the edge of dream and reality. It was a world in a different dimension formed into levels through all kinds of dreams and nightmares from the world of the living an amalgamation of worlds. This was the real reason why the abyss could become a side of the infinite worlds. The places connected to the abyss could be a real world, a dream, or a world beyond fantasy. At first, the abyss was only nothingness, a trivial singularity in the endless void. Then it began to evolve slowly under a kind of mystical, metaphorical power. It took billions of years or even longer before it became what it was today, a special world. But its evolution had not ended and was still continuing causing the abyss to continue extending deeper into the other dimension. In other words, the number of levels of the abyss was still increasing. Even now, no demon knew how many levels the abyss had and where its bottom was. This was why many demons called their world the Endless Abyss. In Arania's memories, the relatively complete and stable parts of the abyss were the spaces where low, middle, and high-ranked demons lived. Well, that also included the birthplaces on the surface in the ocean known as the Endless Ocean. The vast majority of abyss demons and deep sea demons lived in these relatively stable spaces. The spaces at the lower levels of the abyss, 
which were still evolving, were often full of unknown dangers, and there might be space distortions, time distortions, and so on. Therefore, only demons with sufficient strength could tear through the dimensional barriers and enter them. At the same time, because of the large number of these spaces in the deeper abyss, demons with the strength to enter them would usually occupy a level alone. They were the so-called demon lords. Magic power so powerful that it could tear through a dimensional barrier. Although this statement was not very detailed, it was obvious that this was how to promote to demon lord. From Arania's memories, Roy saw the complete general method of promoting from low rank demon to demon lord, which was similar to what Roy had experienced. As for the higher level demon kings, it was not there. And the deadly sin demon king level above the demon king level did not even need mentioning. Of course, the evolution of the abyss was too big of a topic, and it was useless to Roy currently. Roy was more focused on searching for keywords such as demon bible, creator, and chosen one of the abyss. There were some mentions of the demon bible in Arania's memory, but no information on the creator and the chosen one of the abyss at all. According to legend, the demon bible was seven ancient and strange steles, meaning that the entire demon bible only had seven chapters. These steles were hidden in certain lower levels of the abyss, and they contained the mystical power of the spirit of language. If you could find these steles and obtain rubbings of them, you would be able to obtain a portion of the power on them. But the power on these steles was not the kind that possessed powerful destructive force, and some of them were not necessarily as powerful as demons themselves, so demons did not deliberately search for these steles. As time passed, many demons gradually forgot about the existence of these things, and only some ancient demons and demons with complete inherited memories knew a little bit about the demon bible. However, what was strange was that the demon's knowledge of the demon bible seemed to be somewhat different from Roy's. In the sixth chapter of the demon bible that Roy obtained, it mentioned an existence similar to the creator. Logically speaking, there should be similar words in the other chapters of the demon bible. Thus, demons who obtained rubbings or saw inscriptions of the demon bible should know this information about the creator, but no one had ever mentioned the creator. Orania's inherited memories came from the spider demon race, and maybe it was really like what she had said, that it came from the queen of spiders Loth. In that case, these inherited memories naturally represented the knowledge of the demon king Loth. But the problem was that even the inherited memories of the queen of spiders did not mention the word creator. On the contrary, in her inherited memories, the seven deadly sin demon kings had already disappeared from the abyss, and no one knew where they were. However, she thought that the seven steles that recorded the demon bible were left by the seven deadly sin demon kings and that they were the evidence of the strength and will of the seven deadly sin demon kings in the abyss. It was very strange. This gave Roy the feeling that some kind of force had distorted the cognition of demons, making them completely ignore the word creator in the demon bible. The concept of the creator had already been replaced with the concept of the seven deadly sin demon kings. But Roy did not know why he was unaffected. Without the concept of the creator, there was naturally no concept of the chosen one of the abyss. He could not find any information about the chosen one of the abyss from even the complete inherited memories of the spider demons. This made Roy feel more and more that the talent he had obtained mysteriously seemed to be something very indescribable. Therefore, he decided that he would not mention this term to anyone before he figured out what it really was. In Arania's inherited memories, there were many other things, including the technique of soul splitting, the advantages and disadvantages of soul fragments, the names and characteristics of some minerals in the abyss, the rank and strength division of the demon's natural enemy, angels, the use of demon contracts and the corresponding angel contracts, even some secrets about heaven, the meaning of the true names of demons and angels, and so on. He did not dare to say that it contained knowledge of the entire abyss, but at least it included most of it. After reading Arania's memories, Roy instantly had a deeper understanding of the abyss. In fact, as long as Roy survived in the abyss, he would slowly figure out this knowledge sooner or later. However, he did not want to live muddle-headedly in this world like the demons who had cut off inherited memories. Now that he had used the power of the system to create a soul memory reading skill, he finally filled up his inherited memories from Arania's soul. If he had known that there was so much knowledge in the inherited memories, he would have found a spider demon earlier. But it did not matter. Orania came to deliver him a present, so Roy happily accepted it. Chapter 130 Super Large Scale War Summons The compressing of magic power was still going on. Roy had thought that he only needed to compress it once, and his demon heart would be able to accommodate the growth of magic power again. But after getting Orania's inherited memories, Roy found that this compression was actually a requirement. In order to become a high-rank demon, 
the most basic requirement was to compress magic power into a liquid. This liquid state was actually also a concept. It meant that after repeatedly compressing magic power, it could essentially be sensed like the blood in its body. Obviously, this was a very long process. Over the coming days, Roy stayed in the middle abyss and lived a fairly regular life. Every day, when his magic power was abundant, he compressed his magic power once and then brought Fat Tiger, who had returned from mining, to hunt souls and food. Occasionally, he would fight a few demons who intruded into his territory and take away their souls. Although Roy relied on his massive amount of magic power and the innate restraint of frost demons against other demons, winning much more than he lost, as time passed, Roy found his weakness, compared to some old demons, his combat experience was lacking. When he encountered evenly matched opponents and could not rely on his strength to crush them, Roy always fought strenuously because he lacked combat experience. After all, he was still a very young demon in the abyss and could be said to be too young. From his birth until the present, he had been living in the abyss for about two years, and most demons were probably still low rank ones at this time and living in the upper abyss. In contrast, Roy was about to advance to high rank demon. His strength had indeed improved too quickly. However, this increase in strength mainly referred to the increase in magic power. In fact, the overall strength of demons consisted mainly of three things, magic power, physical strength, and combat experience. Roy's improvement was uneven. Therefore, slowing down and promoting to high rank demon was actually beneficial for him. Roy understood this point, so he was not in a rush. Time passed by slowly, and half a year passed by in the blink of an eye. During this half a year, Roy did not go to a gate of the abyss again to respond to the summons to go to another world. Instead, he tried to find other demons to fight against to increase his combat experience. During this time, Roy finally completed his meticulously designed armor. This armor Roy designed used surpluses as reference. It had a helmet, gauntlets, arm guards, shoulder guards, a chest plate, a waist guard, skirt armor, greaves, boots, wings, and so on. All of the materials were made of his black ice. Roy had designed it to be like a transformation skill and usually did not wear it, but when needed, he used the skill to form the armor with magic power. But regrettably, there were not enough souls to materialize this armor. It couldn't be helped. The attributes Roy set for this armor were simply too powerful, so even though he had not used magic energy growth potions during this time and had accumulated 20,000 souls, it was still not enough. Cold Winter Armor, Temporary Name Material Dark Cold Magic Power Equip, one-time consumption of magic power to form the armor. Afterward, there is no need to consume magic power to maintain it. Can be removed when wanted. Indestructible, can withstand powerful physical attacks. Even if the damage exceeds the limit, it will not be completely destroyed, only shattered. Self-repairing, when the armor breaks or is damaged, it will automatically absorb magic power to repair. The repair speed depends on the magic power supply speed. Super Recovery, provides at least 10 times the activity recovery speed and magic power recovery speed. Elemental Resistance, can resist at least 50% of the damage of all known elements. These were the attributes Roy defined for the armor. And for the numbers, Roy did not give it solely to the system to adapt and match like before but made minimum requirements. Not many high quality souls were required to set it as a skill. He could handle two fallen souls. The problem laid in the attributes of the armor itself. They were probably why Roy could not exchange for and materialize the armor. Setting the lower limits was equivalent to raising the attributes of the armor in disguise. In fact, at the beginning, Roy wanted to set it to infinite magic power recovery and life force regeneration, and elemental immunity. However, even a million souls might not be enough for such attributes, and being able to materialize it was not in the foreseeable future. Thus, he could only lower his requirements a little and change the attributes. The 20,000 souls in his hands was not enough, so he simply planned to gather a 100,000 souls to make this armor. Obtaining a 100,000 souls was not too far off for Roy. Speaking of which, if these attributes could be realized, it was almost a divine artifact. Right? This armor was still on paper, so Roy could only look forward to it from time to time to stimulate his thought of collecting souls as soon as possible and modify some small places and flaws while waiting. Just as Roy lived his days regularly and gradually advanced toward high rank demon, there was suddenly an enormous tremor under his feet. Roy thought that it was an earthquake, and in this abyss, seismic activity was quite frequent. Every time an earthquake happened, the tremors were very strong, and it was often accompanied by the eruption of magma. He was already used to it, 
so he did not pay much attention to the tremor. He merely flew into the air with Fat Tiger and intended to wait for the earthquake to pass as usual. However, after a while, he realized that the tremor did not seem to be from an earthquake. Because not long after the tremor occurred, Roy noticed a large amount of black mist spreading in the distance. Roy remembered that there was an altar in that direction, and the black mist was exactly the same as the mist of a gate of the abyss. This discovery made Roy slightly doubtful. Could something have happened to the gate of the abyss? The black mist continued to spread, and it had long exceeded the area covered by the altar. As the black mist filled the air, countless demons appeared. Some demons that usually lived underground dug their way out, and flying demons flew out from their nests. A large number of demons on the ground ran with their feet or four hooves, rumbling toward the black mist. Looking at the excited and fanatical demons that were constantly passing by but did not get into conflicts, Roy finally found the reason from his memory. War Summons Furthermore, it was a super large-scale war summons. The massive amount of black mist meant that a huge gate of the abyss was about to open. And it was probably not only this altar, but altars in other places as well, including the upper and middle levels of the abyss, and possibly even the evolving lower levels of the abyss where the abyss overlords were living. Only like this could such a huge gate of the abyss open. Because this was a war summons initiated by a demon king. Possibly even several demon kings together. A war summons of such scale meant that a true war of world destruction had started. When Roy understood what was going on, he was shocked because this situation seemed to have been only recorded once in Arania's inherited memories. Many demons might not even encounter such a war summons in their entire lives. Facing a war summons of such large scale. The demons were certainly excited and fanatical. Such an immense war also meant that it was extremely dangerous. Roy hesitated a little about whether he should go, but danger also meant huge benefits at the same time. Thinking about the massive number of souls he required for his cold winter armor, Roy gritted his teeth and followed the army. Fat Tiger followed closely behind him as they rushed in the direction of the Black Mist. When he arrived in front of the Black Mist, Roy looked at the large coverage area in surprise. Unlike the mist of a gate of the abyss opened by an altar, which only covered a few meters, the black mist covered almost the entire valley. This meant that when the gate of the abyss opened, it would form a huge gate of the abyss that was dozens of kilometers wide. Roy could not help but feel a chill in his heart. Which unlucky world is going to connect to the gate of the abyss? Such a huge gate of the abyss, and in more than one place, meant that millions or even tens of millions of demons would swarm into the other world. If the other world was unprepared, then there was absolutely no hope, and it was doomed.